we're going to go <laughs> go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, I guess first we need to go ahead and welcome our new our newest commissioner. We've had new commissioners every week, every two weeks lately, but welcome Commissioner Bischel. Um, and you'll be representing Mayor Barry. Um, and we're delighted to have you join us. All right, commissioners, our first item of business is um, the adoption of the agenda. And we have an updated agenda at our desk. Do I have a motion to approve? Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, the next item is the approval of the October 26, 2017 minutes, which we received. Any other discussion? All right. Um, motion to approve. All in favor? Okay. Um, the next is the recognition of council members, and I have not seen who has come in. Which council members do we have here? Yeah, Brenda. Uh, Commission council lady, would you like to come up and speak now, or with your item later this afternoon? Later. Okay. Uh, yes, council lady Van Rees. Hello, happy autumn. I, uh, once again, am pleased to be here uh, about an item on consent, but I just wanted to explain it. Um, there is a name change coming before you on the consent agenda uh, for Old Due West Avenue to Bayshaw Avenue. Um, there has been um, some work by Public Works in regard to uh, the USD change in regard to east due west, west due west, due west north, <laughs> there's also an old due west. And so obviously there, to avoid some confusion for 911, et cetera, I think changing this name is, is a benefit and that's listed on the uh, application. However, I wanted to uh, kind of explain why Bayshaw. So what does that mean, right? Um, they, um, first of all, wanted to let you know that um, in addition to Public Works indicating a desire to avoid 911 confusion, uh, here are some uh, reasons for the name change. On Old Due West, there is a historic grave site named, ba named for the Bayshaw family. Uh, it has, uh, they had property there dating back to the 1800s. Uh, in fact, the Metro Historic Commission did the research on this and verified that Mr. Bayshaw was a Revolutionary War veteran. Uh, we were able to find some descendants in Virginia and they are aware of the pending activity in this area. Uh, the state of Tennessee has confirmed that the old landfill next to the grave site, if you can imagine, yeah, right? Okay. The old landfill next to the grave site um, has been um, cleared for, um, Hang on a second. For the, uh, for approved surface use. You know, when you have an old landfill, in fact, even the, the building of the uh, hospital, Skyline Hospital helped us actually uh, cap the landfill because you had dirt, you had rock, you had dirt again. Uh, the state of Tennessee has confirmed that the old landfill next to the grave has been approved for surface use. Um, the city has been in the process of three projects that are separate and yet concurrent activity that has been planned there. Number one, HCA will be extending a parking lot use and clearing up an entrance to their property from the old due west side. Uh, indeed, they're going to be moving their emergency room entrance to this new side of the building uh, when it, then it's being expanded. Number two, NES will be installing a solar panel farm that will be facing the highway on much of the old landfill site. Number three, the HCA Foundation and Metro Parks as well as NES are working with me, the Historic Commission, uh, Metro Parks and uh, the Mayor's Office um, to approve a new park that would be on the property that will allow tree plantings, what you can't do in a landfill. The park will have a walking path, some exercise equipment along the path and historical markers that emphasizes how the Bayshaw family used the land to sustain themselves and how solar panels are also helping sustain our modern world. 
There will be local school bus tours to this location. It will be a statewide destination point for anyone interested in solar energy. Uh, each of these activities will have an opportunity for public input in the coming months. The park, if approved, will be called Bayshaw Park. It's because of this that the name change to Bayshaw Avenue makes sense, and I appreciate your approval. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, Council Lady Dowell, do you want to speak now or do you want to wait until your item? I'll go ahead and speak now because I have another, we have a, another meeting this evening. But I am speaking on 2017-270 and um, it was on the consent agenda. I really don't know why it's even in your committee. Um, the the, the um, applicant, it, it says that you're consenting to send this over to the uh, Board of Zoning Appeals for a uh, variance to establish a car wash on a, a site uh, that's a commercial site in our district. And I'm opposed to this, as well as many of our neighbors. We've been working on this for about now a year, uh, going back and forth with this potential, this use here. Um, one of the things is, is that for a car wash to be established, we have a structural requirement. And I'm not sure why the, um, I don't even know if the Board of Zoning Appeals have the authority to deviate between uh, the structural requirements of the use uh, for this particular uh, business. Um, I don't see where there's a hardship in it uh, because when we have a car wash, we ask that they're enclosed. And uh, so I, I don't, I really don't understand that. But just, just in general, uh, I do not support this uh, request um, for this variance. Um, I don't really think uh, it's a, uh, a, a, a variance issue. I think it's a use issue. Is can they establish a car wash without meeting the structural requirements that's in our zoning code? And the answer is they either have the requirements met or not. Um, one thing I would tell you about this, you know, they say it's mobile, but there's nobody to enforce whether they're there a couple of days a week or not. There's nothing looking at the storm water. It's a concrete surface, so it doesn't meet any of those storm water requirements either. Um, in addition to all of that, I want to just say that we established an urban design uh, UDO overlay down Murfreesboro Pike, and one of the main reasons we established that UDO was to address like uh, structural issues, designs, and things like that with businesses on the corridor. <coughs> Excuse me, on the corridor. And um, one of the things I'm starting to notice is people trying to get around this. Um, uh, overlay by saying that they're mobile, you know, and moving things from one place to the other and then coming down and trying to get a, a variance to not comply with our overlay. So um, I'm just asking for you to not consent. I don't really know what the recommendation should be from your committee, but I don't really think that uh, it should be approved by you because they're not complying to the use uh, that we require in the zoning code as far as like what the structure should have for a car wash. And, and that's, um, um, those are my comments on it. Okay, thank you. Council Lady Johnson, do you wanna speak now or? Okay. Thank you, Vice Chair Farr, <laughs> Director Sloan, uh, Council Member Bedney, this is the first meeting I get to see you here. <laughs> <laughs> and all of you esteemed uh, commissioners. I am Karen Johnson, uh, District 29, and I am here to speak on item 20, uh, which is 2017Z105PR-001. Uh, uh, this is to change um, property located on Couchville Pike to IWD zoning, which is rare that the entire community would uh, support such a zone change. But again, we have an example here of a developer that um, came to the community and talked over their plans and has been in communications with me and the neighbors overwhelmingly in the Couchville Pike area uh, support this development as a result when we get these good developers that work with their council person and come to the community it always works out as a win-win and uh, so everybody in this area has embraced uh, this development they're very excited 
um, about this office uh, development that's going up with a little bit of some, some warehouse activity, but it's, uh, it's done in a way where it is uh, c uh, comparable to the surrounding uh, properties and to the residences in the area. One of the conditions uh, that the community did place um, upon this developer uh, to ensure that this area does not become a, um, a problem in terms of traffic and public works issues in that area with this type development going in around residences is that a light, um, they are going to be placing a light at Couchville Pike at um, Stewart's Ferry. So one of the conditions, I, I hope and pray, because I haven't looked at what you all have, but one of the conditions that the community expressed to this developer was that they would like for them to place the traffic light at this uh, location. That way, um, there would not be any traffic concerns in the area. So again, thank you all for giving me the opportunity to speak. Congratulations, Commissioner Moore, when you came before our committee. It's great to see you here. Um, but uh, you know, it's good to see new people uh, on our commission. So we're very excited as a city and as a community. But thank you all for giving me the opportunity to speak. And Director Sloan, this is a win-win for Southeast National Antioch District 29. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else that we have missed? Okay. Um, the next item is going to be the uh, list of items for um, deferral, deferral and withdrawal. Yes, um, starting with item number one, the items for deferral with withdrawal. Uh, case 2017-Z023-TX-001, pertaining to sidewalks and religious institutions. Uh, staff recommendation is to defer this text amendment to the December 14th Planning Commission meeting. The next item is item five, case 2017-S-225-001, the Elder Place subdivision, resubdivision of lot one. Uh, on at 3800 Estes Road. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 11th Planning Commission meeting. Next item is item seven, case 2017 NHL-001-002. This is uh, a development plan approval for property at 901 Dalebrook Lane. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 14th Planning Commission meeting. Next item is item 11. 2017 SP-084-001. This is a request to rezone from R8 to SP zoning for property along West Trinity Lane to, to permit up to 26 multifamily units. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 14th Planning Commission meeting. Next items, item 12, case 2017 SP-094-001. A request to rezone from R40 to SP zoning for property at 6404 Eaton's Creek Road. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 14th Planning Commission meeting. Next item is item 14, case 2017 S-243-001, the Anderson Estates resubdivision of lot four uh, and of track 14 at 205 Scaff Drive. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 14th Planning Commission meeting. And I will note on item 14 that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself. Next item is item 15, case 2017 S-254-001, a request for concept plan approval to create 37 single family lots and nine two family lots for property at 2133 and 2315B East Hill Drive. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 14th Planning Commission meeting. Next item is item 19, case 2009 UD-001-009. Uh, this is a request for final site plan approval and modification approval on property located at 2540 Park Drive. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 14th Commission meeting. And then items 25A, 25B, and 25C pertaining to short-term rentals, uh, case 2017Z-024TX, 2017Z-026TX, and 2017Z-027TX are all uh, being 
uh, staff recommendation is to defer to the December 14th Planning Commission for all three items. And those are all of the items on the deferral list. Thank you, Bob. So just to, to recap for everybody, we've got um, items 1, 5, 7, 11, 12, 14, 15, 19, 25A, 25B, and 25C are the items on the um, deferral list. That's correct. Okay. Commissioners, do I have a motion to approve? A second? Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Great. Thank you. All right. Our next item is the um, con consent agenda items. And before I get to the consent agenda items, as information for our audience, if you're not satisfied with the decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of entry of the Planning Commission's decision to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met. Please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. And as notice to the public, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. So as I read the following items into the record, please raise your hand if you'd like one of these items removed. Starting with item number four, case 2017 SP-079-001, a request to rezone from R8 to SP zoning on property at 5923 Robertson Avenue to permit up to five multifamily uh, residential units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. And next item is item number nine, case 2017 M-013SR-001. A request to rename Old Due West Avenue to Bashaw Avenue from Dickerson Pike to Due West Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to approve. Next item is item 10, case 2016 SP-005-003. A request to amend a specific plan by replacing three multifamily units with 4,000 square feet of non-residential space on property located at 1390 and 1400 Adams Street. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Next item is item 13, case 2017 S-198-001, a request for concept plan approval to create up to 11 cluster lots on properties, on a portion of property located at 1213 and 1205 Robinson Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Next item is item 16, case 177-74P-003, a request for a revision and final site plan approval for a portion of a PUD overlay district at 720, 724, and 728 Ermac Drive to permit a hotel. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Next item is item 20, case 2017Z-105PR-001. This is a request to rezone from CN and R20 to IWD zoning on property at 2737 Couchville Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve. Next item on the consent list is item 22, case 2017Z-113PR-001. This is a request to rezone from CS to MULA zoning on property at 1100 1102 and 1104 Buchanan Street. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Next item is item 23, case 2017Z-115PR-001. This is a request to rezone from IR to MUGA zoning for property at 607, 608, and 616 25th Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. And I will note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself on item number 23. Next item is item 24, 2017Z-025TX-001, a request for an ordinance amending Title 17 of the Metro Code, uh, the zoning regulations by amending Section 1716.030E regarding multifamily units associated with artisan manu manufacturing. Staff recommendation is approval. Next item is item 26. It's to amend the 2017, the 2018 through 2022 to 2023 capital improvement budget 
Project 09WS0025 to remove references to the Urban Service District, or USD, and modify the Taxing District to the General Service District, GSD. Uh, staff recommendation is to approve, and I will note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself on item 26. And the last item is item 30, accept the director's report and approve administrative items. And I'm being told that item number 18 can be, can be on the consent as well. Item 18 is case 95P-025-003. This is a request to revise the preliminary plan for a portion of a plan unit development overlay district on property located at 1430 Bell Road to permit 256 multifamily residential units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Thank you, Bob. Okay, um, going back through our consent agenda, um, items four, items nine, item 10, item 13, item 16, item 17, item 18. Got put back on. Not 17, oh, 17 got pulled. 17 got pulled. Okay, sorry. 17, um, 20, 22, 23, 24, 26, and 30. That's correct. Okay. No, 18 got put, uh, 18 got put back on the right. consent. Yes. Do I have a motion to approve? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Okay, thank you. Um, so the items that we're gonna be hearing tonight are items two, three, six, eight, 17, and 21? That's right. 18, got, 18 went back. Okay, so if you are not here for one of those items, um, if you'd quietly leave, <laughs> um, and we will go ahead and get started with item number two. Good evening, commissioners. I'm um, Justin, I'm presenting case number two. This case is a request for a zoning code variance currently scheduled to go before the Board of Zoning Appeals on November 16th. The specific request is to vary from the Metro Zoning Code requirement that a car wash operate within an enclosed structure on property located at 3501 Murfreesboro Pike. The property is outlined here in red. Staff recommends that the Board of Zoning Appeals makes a determination whether to grant the variance. If the variance is not granted, the building permit will be reviewed against the UDO by planning staff. The property is currently zoned Commercial Services District and located within the Murfreesboro Pike Urban Design Overlay. The current policy is T3 Suburban Community Center. Some background, the applicant submitted an application to the Board of Zoning Appeals. The Metro Zoning Code section 17.40.340.B states that the Board of Zoning Appeals shall not grant variances within urban design overlay districts without first considering a recommendation from the Planning Commission. The case is currently scheduled to appear on the November 16th BZA meeting agenda. A car wash is defined in the zoning code as you see on the screen. A building or portion thereof containing facilities for washing more than two automobiles using production line methods with a chain conveyor, blower, steam cleaning device, or other mechanical devices within an enclosed structure or a self-service facility with one or more wash bays that is free or coin operated. Car wash also includes operations that are done by hand, such as auto detailing. For commercial services zoning districts, a car wash is a commercial use permitted with conditions. Those conditions include design-based standards with specific provisions addressing auto-oriented uses. 
the applicant is requesting to vary from condition number three, which states that car washing facilities must operate within an enclosed structure. In terms of process, planning staff would review projects that fall within an urban design overlay district if it is determined by the codes department that a building permit application is required. If the codes department determines that a building permit application is required and the property is located within an urban design overlay district, then the compliance provisions of the overlay would apply and planning staff would review the project against the development standards. For the Murfreesboro Pike UDO, the development standards include the following. Bulk standards such as building setback height and facade width, architectural standards such as building type, glazing materials, and permitted attachments such as balconies, parking and access standards such as the location and number of parking spaces, streetscape standards in compliance with the major and collector street plan, landscape standards such as planting areas around parking and required number of trees and signage standards. The UDO does not govern uses nor does it take into account a range of informal activities or incremental structures that may not require a building permit. Provided the codes department does not require a building permit, these structures and activities might include food trucks, booth vendors with limited hours of operation, or temporary events with tent-like structures, for example. In conclusion, staff is recommending that the BZA determine whether to grant the variance. If the variance is not granted, the building permit will be reviewed against the UDO and by planning staff. Thank you. We'll go ahead and open up the public hearing. Is the applicant here? My Thank name you. is Nick Bailey, and I represent Mr. Abraham Whitaker, who is the applicant. Um, and just a little bit of background on this. Can I get, sorry, can you name and address first? I'm sorry, address? Uh, 4700 Elkins Avenue. Okay. Thank you. Um, this matter was, uh, our request for a variance was filed with the Board of Zoning Appeals. We were set to be on their agenda at the last uh, hearing date they had. Um, it, prior to that, the uh, zoning administrator had determined that because we were not uh, asking at this point to build anything on that structure, nor are we asking even the BZA to do that, that there would be no reason for them to come to planning unless and until the BZA considered it, and then depending on what they did, if, if our variance was granted and we're able to operate without a permanent structure, there would, the UDA would not, UDO would not be triggered and we wouldn't even have to, to come here. Um, that was his position at, at the time. It was, I think, informally discussed with the staff here and thought to be the correct position. Uh, and the reason the council member said she didn't know why it was on, the reason it was on is because she insisted that it come here. And that's why we got put on this. And I think the staff has the right uh, recommendation on this because at this point it's premature to come before this body. I mean, we really, our, our variance is being requested uh, for this temporary use, which is not, it's not a car wash, it's a car detailing business that uses the uh, tents that uh, Mr. Wallace was talking about. Uh, there's a, not even any sewer service on this property. It's vacant land. He's, you know, not going to build a car wash. That's not his business model. Um, so I would submit to, to this board that uh, at this particular time, the staff recommendation should be accepted because there's really, it's premature to, to really even come before this board until we go before the BZA next week. And this is Mr. Abraham Whitaker, and you can give him your address, I guess. He's the applicant. Okay. 753 Dover Glen Drive, Antioch, Tennessee. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, you will have two minutes for rebuttal. Okay. Uh, do we have anyone here speaking in favor of this item? Anyone speaking in opposition? Would you please come up and you'll have two minutes and please state your name and address. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here this evening. My name is David Chilton at 1416 Forest Away, Antioch, Tennessee. Uh, I am the Metro Beautification Project Manager Commissioner for District 33. Uh, this particular site is right across the street from our, the border of, of the district that I represent. Uh, there's already some existing development on that 
intersection there. There's been a development of a public center, a Goodwill store, which is uh, very attractive. It meets the standards of the overlay that had been in place by the city. It's very nice and attractive. And this overlay, which was uh, done several years ago, it's uh, put in place to ensure a high standard of building and businesses that go into our area. This is a very promising area. Uh, I know the uh, owner would like to see a, this car wash go in there. Already on this property are concrete pads, aluminum carport, there are portable food wagons out there, and there are tents that are set up. And there's also a porta potty that is out there all the time. I was under the impression a porta potty is supposed to be temporary. Uh, I was a little taken aback when I heard the comment that that is not really a car wash. Uh, my observation is that it is a car wash. In fact, two weeks ago, I drove by and asked them how much for a car wash, and I was quoted $30. So, well, what does that mean? That means your time. Totally your time is up. I don't even yes. have 10 seconds. You can finish your sentence. Concern about the stormwater uh, concerns the building and the overlay violation, and I've asked that it be enforced. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else speaking in opposition? If the applicant would like to come back up and use your two minutes for a rebuttal. I would just say briefly there, as I said, there is no sewer service on the property. Uh, the car detailing, not the car wash, the car detailing that Mr. Whitaker does uh, has a water reclamation system. So there's no runoff. He, he ca captures the water that he uses. Uh, the porta potty that he's talking about must be associated with the uh, temporary food truck, which is not Mr. Whitaker. Okay. So that's really the only thing I'd add. Okay, thank you. Council Lady Dowell, do you want to come back up? I just want to clarify something. He said he didn't know why he's here. I think it should be here because I think um, the going back and forth to the zoning appeals, um, the reason why I think it should be here is because this is a car wash. It's not a mobile car wash. There's nobody to enforce how many days they're out there operating. They said three days. Well, they're out there more than three days. And, they, and this is also a, a mobile, food mobile operation too. I don't know if they told you this. It is food truck plus the car wash. There has been no traffic type mediation on this lot. Um, they do have water runoff, because that was one of my concerns, because it's not a permeated surface, so the water is running off. There are no, um, if you look at this lot, uh, the water settles there, because there's no ditches there, so that is a concern of mine. I actually spoke with them, and I told them, I said, if you want to operate this, let's get you legal. And I want to put this in context real quickly, is that the reason why we established the overlay is because we wanted the design standards and we wanted to have some type of control and, and structure on these uses. Because what we see now is up and down that road, a whole bunch of people just setting up anywhere uh, and not complying to our overlay since he set up. Um, it is true, they, and, I, and I tried to stop them in the beginning. They paved it, uh, cars are backed up on Mount View Circle, coming out on Murfreesboro Pike. That needs to be looked at. It's not like you're having one car come in there and leave. Uh, this is a, and essentially it's a car wash, and it is a full-time operation between having the, the food truck there and the car wash, and it's not what we establish in the overlay as far as that goes. And the, the variance is asking you, uh, asking for us to exclude him from uh, complying to the car wash code. And the car wash code says that if you're going to operate a car wash, then you have to meet certain standards, and it has to be enclosed. And then we do have stormwater standards. So I, I think this business does not comply with the use. And that's why, uh, and it, it, there's, if he's not planning to enclose it and construct a car wash, then we don't need to go to ask for a variance. Because what we're basically doing is asking the BZA is to disregard the zoning code and make a determination on the use of a piece of property. And, and that's what I don't agree to. I think that this property is not compliant. Uh, the BZA should not be given a recommendation per 
say uh, uh, a variance. I mean, I'm certain that they would agree with me that no variance is needed because the code says that the use for a car wash requires an enclosed structure. So um, that, that is the reason why I think really zoning can make a determination that this does not comply with the use and, and we can be done from there. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go ahead and close the public hearing and um, this is kind of a complicated. <laughs> um, Dr. Sun, would you like to give a little bit of background just to kind of go back over what we heard? Yeah, there? so um, we don't control use, uh, especially on a, a property that is has a, uh, is already zoned, it's not an SP that where we would speak to that. It is in a UDO though. And when someone seeks a variance uh, in a UDO, the uh, BZA asks for a recommendation from the planning department, uh, the planning commission. And we usually handle those administratively. Uh, that's generally how that, that moves forward. But what we can't do is speak to what uses are permitted or to really even comment on appropriate uses on a property. That's the zoning administrator uh, and the BZA under certain circumstances could speak to that as well. But that's just not something we control. And what we've said in our recommendation is if they don't build a structure, then there's really nothing for us to review against the UDO. If the BZA were to give them that variance, and if the BZA doesn't give them that variance, then they've got to meet the UDO. But until we see something that's proposed, assuming that the BZA tells them they cannot get a variance and tells them they have to build a structure, at that time when plans are drawn up for those structures and submitted to us, then we would review them to make sure that they meet the UDO standards. But we don't, at this time, have anything to review other than to say just that to the BZA in our recommendation. Wouldn't it have been better to defer it after BZA then, or? Well, we still have to give a recommendation. It's just very unusual that someone would go, uh, that would submit a, uh, a request for a variance without any structure at all. That's just not something we normally see. Uh, so normally we would have something that we were reviewing that we would give comments on. We just don't have it here. And all we've been able to say then is if, if they give the variance and there's no structure, then there's nothing for us to review it against. If they don't, then we'll need to see a set of plans and we'll review that against the UDO when we get it. And, that, and that's our recommendation. And so what we're looking for is either a, the commission to agree or disagree with that recommendation. Well, I agree. I do want to ask about the structure that is there though, the carport, I guess it is. Was that always there or? I well, I'm not sure about that, but, but to that point, so uh, that's why we have property standards division in the codes department. And that if someone's using their property improperly, if they have a structure on the property that's not permitted, then that's who should cite them, bring them, give them an opportunity, give a notice of violation is the way that happens. They send them a letter saying, hey, you're in violation. Usually they do that first. They, if they fail to remedy whatever the problem is, then they will cite them into environmental court and then they have a hearing in front of the environmental uh, law judge. Uh, then they're given, well, maybe or maybe not, depending on how the judge feels that day, the opportunity to remedy it. Uh, but that's still not something the planning department uh, would review. Uh, well, my, I, I agree with staff recommendation. I think that's, that's the proper way to uh, go to the BCA first. Okay. Commissioner Sims? Commissioner Bischel? I have to agree with the staff recommendation. It's too complicated. It's got to be the right thing. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Councilman Ben Badney? Yeah, I don't agree with the staff recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason is I used to be on the BZA, and, and so this doesn't sound right uh, at a you know, what I remember about what we did at the BZA. But I have a couple of questions, if I may. Sure. What did they apply for when they went to pull the permit? You're asking what the permit is that they applied for? Is a car wash to operate a car wash? But they say that it's not a car wash, that it's a car detail. Right, I don't have the permit in front of me, but the permit was for a car wash, and then they uh, 
filed an application to the BZA to request a variance to one of the conditions of a car wash use. Okay, that's an important question. Is, did they apply for a car detail or for a car wash? I can't speak specifically to what's on the building permit itself. Uh, the application that we're reviewing, what does that application say they're filing a request for? The application to the BZA? Yes. Is specifically uh, to request a variance to a car wash condition that it be enclosed in a structure. So they are saying it's a car wash and they want an exception to that car wash requirement that it be not enclosed. That is correct. Okay. We're not reviewing the building permit application, we're reviewing the BZA applicate. Okay. Because they say here that they were applying for a car detail place, but they apply for a car wash. Car wash is the use in the zoning code, um, and so it's the closest thing to what, what they want to operate on that property as determined by the zoning administrator. Right, but they say here they were not doing a car wash. It's the closest thing that they, that's listed closest, as a use. Uh, yeah. It's irrelevant. What did they, because that's an important distinction. Their use, they're getting a use permit for a car wash because for the zoning administrator okay. determined that that's what their use would be in the zoning code. All right. W is a car wash, a car wash is permitted on a CS zoning, right? A car wash is permitted in CS zoning with conditions, yes. How about a car detail? Is it permitted on a CS zoning? The zoning administrator, it's, there's some uses that aren't in the zoning code, and the, so the zoning administrator has to d determine what the closest use in the code is to what they're asking to do. So they're asking to do a car detailing use, and so he determined that that falls under car wash use in the zoning code. And, and then that's a permitted with conditions use in the code, and that's that's how they determine the use. I mean, they, there's a lot of times where people will come in with uses that aren't specifically in the code, so the zoning administrator has to classify them a, as per something that is in the code. Can you put that slide back up that defines the car wash? Doesn't it say car wash includes operations done by hand, such as auto detailing? And, th and that's a fantastic question for the zoning administrator. Uh, but that's not something the planning department does. We don't make those determinations. The, that is the exclusive purview of the zoning administrator. And if someone disagrees with the analysis that the zoning administrator's done and thinks that it is, in fact, a car wash, and that is the analysis that's being done, actually, and I think he's saying it, it is a car wash. I don't think that he's not saying it's a car wash, the zoning administrator. Uh, but if someone disagreed with the zoning administrator's opinion on that, then they can do what's called an item A appeal to the BZA and challenge the, the zoning administrator's uh, interpretation. Yeah, but how would the BZA uh, use the hardship definition to decide? Uh, again, that would be I, the BZA's yeah. purview. I, I think we are well into a discussion of things that are not within the purview of the planning commission mm -hmm. or the planning department, but the BZA and the zoning administrator. And that's really what we were trying to say in our recommendation is we don't have anything to review yet. When you have a structure and you want to build something, then, then we engage um, and we will compare it to the UDO. And if they don't get the variance, we will. And if they fail to get the variance, uh, they will either have to stop operations, I suspect, now, this is again up to the BZA, but they would probably have to stop operations if they don't get the variance, uh, or they'll have to come in with a plan to build a structure, at which time then we would review it. Yeah, I just, sorry, um, do I get to speak, continue to speak? Yes, you may yeah. speak. Uh, <laughs> it's, I'm new here, so sorry. So uh, why did they want to pull a perm? They... Uh, that I'm not sure of. Uh, if I had to guess, they probably got cited. Uh, but if they don't need a permit, uh, why did they even bother to go pull? I mean, if I wanted to raise goats on that property, do I need a permit? 
Well, uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, no, I, I don't we, believe in it. No, no, you couldn't get a permit to raise goats in CS. Uh, well, let's let's assume it's uh, <laughs> it's a rural uh, zoning, and I wanted to raise goats, and I don't build anything, so I wouldn't need to. It, if your zoning allowed the use that you wanted to do, and and that that use didn't require an enclosure, then yes, you could go do that. Mm -hmm. But the code says, uh, at least my reading of it, uh, says that it requires an enclosure. And so what I believe the applicant's trying to do is to say, we want to do this activity there, but we don't think we need an enclosure and we would like the BZA to give us that variance. Now, I don't necessarily disagree with your analysis about whether or not this meets the the required hardship criteria that's set out in the state statute to get that variance or not, but that is a decision for the BZA to make, not for us. All right. Well, I'm I'm not convinced I'm going to vote no, but I appreciate the answers. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Blackshear, I'll let you go next. Um, I agree with the staff's recommendation that this be heard before the BZA. <laughs> Commissioner Moore? Yeah, I think it's tough, but I also agree with that recommendation. Okay. So we need a motion to... I'm, I'll make a motion to um, approve staff recommendation. A second. Other discussion? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay, so we have one opposed. Okay, thank you. Next item is going to be item number three. The next item on this evening's agenda is item three. This is a request to permit up to 15 multifamily residential units. Staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. The site is located at 1699, 1701, 1703, and 1705 Lishy Avenue at the northeast corner of Lishy Avenue and Marshall Street. The site is currently zoned RS5, which is, requires a minimum 5,000 square foot lot as in, and is intended for single family dwellings. As you are familiar, this image shows the growth and preservation map, which was adopted by the Planning Commission as a part of Nashville Next. The growth and preservation map identifies areas which are the most appropriate for growth to occur. This map indicates the location of the site relative to the transition areas, tier one and tier two centers. This site is identified by the orange dot on the screen. The site is located approximately four miles from downtown, less than half a mile from the Dickerson Pike Corridor, which is designated as a tier two center, and 675 feet south of the corridor along Trinity Lane, designated as a transition area. This map illustrates the surrounding network of arterial and collector streets, along with the grid pattern of surrounding local streets. This site fronts a residential corridor, Lishy Avenue. Marshall Street, shown here along the southern portion of the site, is currently unbuilt. But as you can see, if constructed, it would begin to reconnect the network of local streets in this area, which is supported by the policy. Lishy Avenue, which is the purple line in the middle of the screen, contains existing MTA service along with an MTA stop directly fronting this site. Existing sidewalks along both sides of Lishy Avenue provide a path for pedestrian travel from the site to the corridor along Trinity Lane to the north. Publicly accessible open space is located at Tom Joy Park, approximately 1,220 feet to the northeast of the site, identified here as the green square. The policy for this area was changed from T4 Urban Neighborhood Maintenance to T4 Urban Neighborhood Evolving at the January 12, 2017 Planning Commission meeting. 
five community meetings were held to engage and inform the public about the policy change. And as you can see, the meetings occurred from October 10th, 2016 through November 9th of 2016. A total of five meetings were held. Staff hosted a community open house with maps of the proposed policy changes on November 9th, 2016, and maps of the proposed policy changes were also posted to the Planning Department's website on November 10th of 2016. On September 21st, the applicant stated that they met with the Highland Heights Neighborhood Association to discuss the project, and they stated that approximately 40, give or take, people were in attendance. The policy for this site is T4 Urban Neighborhood Evolving. T4 Urban Neighborhood Evolving is intended to create and enhance urban residential neighborhoods that provide more housing choices, improve connectivity, and moderate to high de density development patterns with shallow setbacks and minimal spacing between buildings. The proposed SP is consistent with the policy, which is intended to enhance urban neighborhoods with a variety of housing choices and high levels of connectivity. The site plan consists of four lots on approximately 0.87 acres. The SP proposes up to 15 multifamily residential units for the site. Five of the proposed units will front Lichy Avenue and four units will front Marshall Street to the south. The six remaining units will front onto interior open space. Marshall Street, located at the southern portion of the site, will be constructed as part of this development. The plan limits the total, the maximum height to two and a half stories and 36 feet. The maximum height for the three units oriented toward the open space adjacent to the eastern property line will be limited to a maximum of two stories and 30 feet. The site plan also proposes a 15-foot wide landscape buffer along the north and east property lines. This buffer will be located between the proposed units along the northern property line and the units fronting Marshall Street. This SP achieves two critical planning goals. It creates an opportunity for urban development that fills in gaps in areas served by existing infrastructure. The proposed dwellings will provide additional housing choice for the residents in the area. In conclusion, staff's recommendation is to approve the conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Thank you. We'll go ahead and open up the public hearing. Is the applicant here? Please come forward and state your name and address. You'll have 10 minutes and can hold two back for rebuttal. Thank you. Do I have to turn? There we go. Uh, good afternoon, uh, commissioners, councilmen. I uh, want to thank you for your time today and your service to this commission. I want to first of all thank the staff. Um, excuse me. I'm Scott Morton, Smith G Studio, uh, 1005 North 14th Street. I am a, work for Smith G Studio. We're the local uh, architecture and urban planning firm that is the consultant for this property and the applicant that's here today. Um, we want to really thank staff uh, for their key uh, input during our planning effort, uh, really understanding the policy that was in place and working with the staff to generate a plan that uh, worked within the policy and met the policy goals that were adopted by this commission earlier this year. Um, we feel that through that dialogue we were able to get um, a really good site plan that, that really will provide value to the community. As far as our process, um, beyond engaging the staff early, we also met with the Highland Heights Neighbors Association. They have a two-step process in their um, development, reviewing development projects. One is they have a development review committee that you have to meet with first, and we met with that committee and the members of that committee against the design guidelines that they have put into place for to judge projects against. And they agreed with us that our proposal met several of the, the critical design guidelines that were in place from that committee, including introducing density along a major corridor, introducing an evolving and broader range of housing types to meet different housing needs, and improving mobility options of walking, biking, transit um, access, and driving options. It ensured continued affordability for residents as well by providing a smaller square footage home and a smaller price point for, that would serve the workforce um, housing within the community. Regarding policy, I won't get too much back into what staff said, but you know, we, we talked a lot about policy and how to come up with a plan on this corridor where existing transit service is and to provide um, an option that would create value along this corridor but would also be in context 
with the local community. And so working with staff and working with the community based on their input, um, we looked at transitions and scale. We looked at the type of units. These are single family detached units, small cottage units where architecturally we want to take cues off the surrounding development so that it fits in within the community um, along the Lishy Major Corridor as well as along Marshall Street to the south, which is the new improved right of way that we'll be building as part of this application. The uh, excuse me, all right, good. plan supports um, diversity of housing. Again, the smaller footprints allow us to create a price point um, that we think will create something that's not currently available in the marketplace, and we think that's a really good thing, um, especially in this uh, very hot urban market, infill market. Um, and lastly, we met with the larger community group as well at Pylon Heights um, following week after meeting with the development committee. And we had a generally a good reception, a large crowd showed up, several members of the community, some of which are here today, stayed afterwards to have some conversation about the project and you know, to note some of their concerns. Some of the concerns included the extension of Marshall Street, which is currently today an unimproved right of way, which means it's just vacant, it's just um, existing vegetation, there's no street there. As part of this application, Public Works and Planning has requested that we build that right of way at our cost um, for this development. And so some of the residents uh, were concerned about that right of way being built and ultimately the extension of it all the way that would connect the street network all the way to the adjacent street, Joy Avenue. Um, that some of that frontage was undesirable according to some of the community residents, especially neighbors that would be impacted by that new street in the back of their houses. Secondly, there was some general concern about the density that's being proposed, that it's not a single family house that we're building on this site. Um, you know, we explained how we were working within the policy with the staff um, that's in place that was recently adopted and that, you know, within the range of density for that policy, it can support in the right circumstances up to 40 units an acre. We felt like what we've, we've presented, it's around 17 units an acre, fell well within the reasonable density range that this policy supports. Um, and so, you know, we want to keep our application as presented to you today with the 15 cottage units as presented. Um, so with that said, I want to to close with um, thanking the community again for their input and um, Councilman Davis, who couldn't be here today, um, he's traveling for business. I met with him last week. He has, we have his support for this project and we'll continue to work with him at the council level. Um, and I'm glad to answer any questions that you may have and I look forward to your input. Thank you. Thank you, you'll have two minutes for a rebuttal. Um, is there anyone here speaking in favor of this project? Anybody here speaking in opposition? Can you please come forward and um, if you guys can go ahead and line up and you'll have two minutes each, uh, please state your name and address. Thank you, commissioners. Um, my name is Gordon Stacy Harmon and I reside at 1826 Joy Circle. I stand opposed to this application for rezoning to SP for two basic reasons, project density and development of Marshall Street. Density will be a recurrent theme tonight for me Planning 15 units on less than one acre is incongruent with surrounding properties and will create a micro neighborhood within our neighborhood. While the developers speak of affordable housing, the average projected cost of units on this property is $250,000. Whether this is truly affordable and workforce housing is, is another debate. One part of the reasons cited for such high cost for such small homes is the cost to partially develop Marshall Street. This is a public right of way that will only serve residents in this particular project. According to the developer, they are required to incur, not requested, but required to incur this expense in exchange for public works approval of this project. We face increasing density throughout our neighborhood. This is not only the, the only project, but it is one that helps set precedent that many of my neighbors do not encourage nor want. When this project was presented to the um, Highland Heights Neighborhood Association, many in attendance were outspoken about concerns for this specific project. We should have comments on record as well as a letter in opposition sent by the president of our association. Um, one additional comment that I have, uh, I've been a member of this neighborhood for almost 10 years. Uh, just two months ago, when I got the um, zoning hearing for this particular project in the mail, that's when I learned that we had a neighborhood association. 
That's also when I learned that we have had this big vote to change from neighborhood maintenance to neighborhood evolving. There is, from my understanding, close to 5,000 residents in the area that's impacted by that policy change. We were never notified, and we were never even given an opportunity. While there may have been 40 people that showed up for that particular discussion, I was one of the few, or excuse me, one of the many that had no idea it was even going on, and we are moving to change back to neighborhood maintenance. Thank you. Thank you. Please come forward, state your name and address. Hi, my name is Christy Grace, and I live at 1603 Lishy Avenue. Um, my concerns with this are this is two houses down from, or two lots down from where I live. Um, my house, like the other houses in this part of the street, is a single family home. Uh, mine is a two bedroom house built uh, as a farm foreman's home in the 1800s. Um, this part of Lishy Street is not a main corridor in any reasonable sense. Uh, yes, a bus goes down it from time to time, but this is an old, old street with a lot of old houses on it. It's narrow. Um, and we're talking about single family homes in the heart of the neighborhood. It's not out on Trinity. It's not out on Dickerson. This is right in the middle of our little neighborhood, which is cohesive as a neighborhood. And I'm not comfortable with the precedent that this sets in terms of density or in terms of the fact that it's this little kind of self-contained unit, like it's a little island within our established neighborhood. Um, there is significant neighborhood opposition um, on this, and with this development being one of many that has been going on in our neighborhood, this level of change is not what anyone hoped for or anticipated or even understood was going to happen um, for when we switched from neighborhood maintenance to neighborhood evolving. I wasn't a part of that. I was one of the many who didn't know it was happening because we weren't notified. Um, and even those who, who did know that it was happening were confused and did not understand that this was what our neighborhood was going to be in for. We are not comfortable with this change, and I personally think it's a terrible precedent to set in a neighborhood that I really love. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, good evening, commissioners. My name is Ashanti Davis. I live at 321 Edwin Street. Um, I'm about three, four blocks from this particular development. Over the last, I don't know, six months, you guys have seen a lot of me, and I apologize, because I am not trying to waste your time, and because I think your time is valuable. The only reason why I keep showing up is because I have lived in this neighborhood my entire life, and I am incredibly passionate about it. And while I understand that Nashville has changed a bunch and development is necessary, and I am pro-development, it's just in this particular area, there is a lot going on all at once, and we are on aging infrastructure. We have a stormwater problem. We have an electrical grid problem. I, my, I have a power outage like three times a year. And so there's a lot to, and keeping increasing the density is a lot considering that those other issues are going on. And I am recently joined the Highland Heights Neighborhood Association as well, and I will let you know, I live less than 500 feet from where they meet. I've lived in that neighborhood my entire life. I had no idea any of this was going on until I, until I started showing up here. And so to say that there's significant community engagement is sort of a misrepresentation because I think there's a lot of my neighbors from me going to knock on doors, collecting letters. A lot of people don't understand the impact of what's going on and a lot of people are concerned. And the last thing I will say is, you know, a lot of developers come up here and tell you they've had significant community engagement. I used to be a litigator, and I knew that when I got the right settlement, it was when I wasn't happy and the other side wasn't happy. That's a real compromise, because nobody's really happy, but you got it done. And in this case, I don't feel like this particular developer has listened to any of our concerns and hasn't compromised in any sense of the word. And if you look at the road that they're building, it's a road that goes to nowhere. It's to the backyard of somebody else. That's not creating another road to connect to the main road. It's a road that leads to somebody's backyard. And that's all I'll say. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Is there anybody else here speaking in opposition? Okay, the applicant wants to come back. You'll have two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Um, 
So respectfully, just, just a little bit about the noticing procedures. We, you know, we take cues of following the protocol of the council member in the district, which we did is to meet with the Highland Heights Development Committee and then the Highland Heights Neighborhood Association, in addition to the standard Metro protocols for noticing for applications to the Planning Commission. And so, you know, we followed what we felt was the appropriate notification process that was requested by the community, this commission, and the council member. Um, you know, as far as the density goes, again, as stated before, based on the policy in this area, we believe that we're well within what the policy does support for a corridor um, and is really pushing this type of development against corridors rather than the hearts of community. Specifically at this location um, with access to the, the mass transit facility um, and its close proximity to downtown and Ellington Parkway and Dickerson Pike. In regards to the Marshall Street extension, Marshall Street is a 50-foot right-of-way that goes from Lishy Avenue at our intersection all the way to Joy Avenue. We would be the first project that would be responsible for building the first component of Marshall Street, which is ultimately to tie into Joy Avenue as property redevelops in the adjacent area. We've been requested to do this um, by Public Works and Planning to uh, improve connectivity in the area. We sympathize with the residents who, who think who will be affected by the right-of-way extension that currently, you know, may treat some of that area as their backyard, even though it's currently public right-of-way. But we believe that this extension is the first step in developing a future connection between Lishy and Jones that will benefit the future growth in the area and the community long-term and provide a vital connectivity within this urban infill site. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead and close the public hearing and um, Commissioner Blackshear. Yes. Get started. So I guess one of the reasons why we are here is because the um, policy has changed from neighborhood maintenance to neighborhood evolving. And we've heard um, some of the neighbors talk about how they weren't aware of the change from, evol from maintenance to evolving and how um, I guess their plans to move it back. Can you talk about um, how the neighborhood was engaged in the process of changing the policies and then whether there's been some official action to actually move it back to maintenance? A plan amendment that was primarily at the request uh, of the council member due to a lot of uh, rezoning requests in, in this district. So uh, we worked with the council member to notify the neighborhoods and it was determined that uh, the outreach would be done through the neighborhood associations. So these were held at uh, regularly scheduled uh, neighborhood association meetings. Okay, so if you weren't aware of the neighborhood association, then you would not have been aware of the plan change, is that correct? That is correct, and, okay. and a lot of that had to do with the fact that the, the rules and procedures require a certain notification requirement. Um, it was uh, 5,500 residents would have been notified for this plan amendment request. And it was requested at that time to the Planning Commission that we waive those requirements and hold these series of meetings as well as a public open house uh, where over 100 people attended this, uh, these meetings as well as a public open house to discuss the, the plan amendment. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm empathetic to the neighbors who um, I guess didn't know that this was changing. I am interested um, one of the first neighbor, I think, said that they are interested in changing it back. Um, and I, can you talk about the process of how that works? Sorry. <laughs> can you talk about the process and, and really, like, what is the first official action that would be taken to change it? The first official action is that you would come in and meet with staff if someone were interested in changing their policy. And we would discuss what, what those changes might be. Um, and we would talk about what things might affect those changes and what we might recommend to you all uh, based on the context, the existing zoning, um, access to transit. You know, we, we would discuss all those things in the, the policy discussion. And then we would determine a boundary for the, the, the change. 
and uh, based on that boundary, we would uh, draw up a determination form, which is essentially a fancy way of just saying a boundary for the study area. Uh, the executive director then reviews that boundary determination form. He signs it, and the applicant requesting that change uh, brings that determination form in with an application to change the policy based on that determination form. So this may be an unfair question and probably really premature even if it was fair, um, but how likely would it be if, if something was just changed, say, um, a year ago, mm -hmm. um, how likely would it be that it be returned to the original policy? I, I don't know how likely that would be. A lot of everything that we do regarding policy starts with a community conversation. So uh, we'd have to go out to the community and engage their interest in changing the policy back. And obviously that would be weighed into all these other things that, that we talked about, context and zoning and access and, and all those sorts of things. If I, yeah. if I could, Commissioner. Um, it, I know that we, we do have a lot of new commissioners, uh, but the commission uh, instructed us to go and engage the councilman and have community meetings because uh, we had what I think is fair to say a barrage of rezonings from the councilman uh, in this district uh, that did not meet the policy. And item after item that came before the commission, the commission said, we like the plan, but it doesn't meet policy, so I can't vote in favor of it because it's a neighborhood maintenance policy. And the history of how it became a neighborhood maintenance policy goes all the way back to Council Lady uh, Pam Murray, uh, who downzoned the entire district, all with one fell swoop, uh, to, um, yeah, that would have been, uh, well, it would have been more than 10 years ago, uh, maybe 12 years ago, but, but, but close to that. Uh, and that the economy in Nashville was vastly different than it is today. And a lot of what was happening in the area was that homes were being torn down and these very uh, minimalistic duplexes and triplexes and quads were being built. And she was trying to stop that. At least that's what my impression of why she did that was. And she rezoned it all to RS. Now fast forward to Nashville next, uh, and we're trying to do the policies for the entire city, and you look at an area of town that has, um, for the most part, uh, the same lot pattern uh, throughout the district, and it has the same zoning, this RS zoning, and that screams out neighborhood maintenance. That's what that looks like. Um, and when we engage the community, uh, you know, I don't know that we heard anything other than neighborhood maintenance. Now, move forward in time, uh, just past Nashville next, and the new councilman starts bringing in all those uh, rezonings that, that, we, that, this, that you were a part of and, and that many other uh, <laughs> One other uh, <laughs> commissioner was, was here for that uh, and saw that happen. And so we were instructed to try to work with the councilman to try to get the policy correct for the area and see if there are areas that should be neighborhood maintenance remain neighborhood maintenance, which is the vast majority of it, frankly, and what should move to neighborhood evolving. And look at the proximity to the corridors, look at other factors, look at lot patterns, uh, and make that determination about whether we think that is appropriate in those areas, and go out and have community meetings and, and reach out to the community and see how they feel about it. So we did that. And then we brought those policies back to this commission, and uh, we had a public hearing, and uh, and it was voted to, to change that. Now, let me also say that the planning department has limited resources. That's a reality uh, of where we, the world we live in. We elevated that project uh, because of not just the things that this commission was being confronted with, but the council was being confronted with. We literally had council members begging us to do something about the district because of the number of disapprovals that they were still seeing at the council level. So. So we did elevate it above other projects. There's a long list of projects that the council wants us to deal with, whether they're UDOs that council members would like us to move forward with, uh, or whether it is uh, readdressing some of the policies in different areas that they think that, that, that it wasn't correct in. Um, 
we elevated above those because of the sheer amount of pressure that this commission and that the council was feeling and frankly direction from this commission mm -hmm. uh, who by the way I work for uh, so we, we took that up sooner so to take it back up again I, I'll go through all that to make sure that everybody understands the gravity of asking that uh, to then now take those same resources and don't use it in the other areas, but now take up the same area again, another effort to readdress this, I would say uh, that I don't know that I would prioritize it over some of the other issues that we have, that we are confronted with that we need to spend our resources on. It's not that it's not important, it's not that it not doesn't need to be addressed, uh, but without direct instruction from this commission, I doubt that it would be elevated over some of the other areas in town that haven't seen the attention that they need since Nashville Next was passed. Can I just ask one question while we're on the policy? Can we put the policy map back up there just so that everybody can see where the neighborhood evolving and neighborhood maintenance boundaries are? And then I'll let you keep going, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. I'm, um, I guess I'm just worried that, so we did Nashville next where it was neighborhood maintenance and then we um, had a public hearing. Obviously there are neighborhood association meetings prior to that where we changed it very soon after to neighborhood evolving. We hear neighbors now saying that they didn't know about it. I know there are only three neighbors here today, but um, if you take their word truthfully, which I do, there are other people many other people they've talked to in the neighborhood that also, I guess, either weren't aware or just didn't understand um, what this means. And now there's some, at least some appetite to take it back to neighborhood maintenance. Um, so that's just an underlying um, concern and I absolutely hear the neighbors about that. Um, so, but right now there is this neighborhood evolving policy in place. And, Although this is allowable or permissible, perhaps under neighborhood evolving, the question is for us whether it still is an appropriate um, SP, I think it's an SP, right? Yes. SP to take place. Um, and I probably, if I lived in the neighborhood, would be um, somewhat concerned about the density doubling. The, the, what they could do now is seven, is that correct? Yes, seven's based on gross acreage, but we would still need to apply the subdivision regulations to any proposed subdivision to see what they could actually have. Okay, so the max would be seven, is that yes, what you're saying? Yes, just based on acreage alone. Okay, and now they're going to 15. 15 is So proposed. that's over doubling um, the density. I, I would probably be in favor of a little bit lower density. And also one of the other points that um, the neighbor neighbors made was that I guess Lishy is a corridor, but it does, when you look at it, when you, just, when you just look at a picture of it, it does seem like it's in the middle of the neighborhood, um, which obviously could give rise to concern about the density being so high compared to what they would be otherwise allowed. Um, I would say that the major and collector street plan identifies Lissy as a residential collector. That okay. is the actual term it's assigned to. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I probably um, would be in favor of somewhat lower density um, going in there, but I'm really interested to hear what the other commissioners have to say. Commissioner Moore? Um, I, I guess I feel a little stuck on this one. I definitely understand why it's proposed based on the policy, but I, I also have concerns just um, from hearing from the neighbors, so I really think I'll pass and hear from the other commissioners on this as well. Okay. Commissioner Tibbs. Um, well, I guess first on the policy, I, and um, thank you, um, Doug, for going through that, the history. It, it does seem, though, since it was, this has been changed in less than a year, you know, I, and the uh, slide that was up before this showed all the different um, steps that were taken. I, as, as quickly as we, as you had pointed out, Commissioner Blanchier, about from change from National Next, but it seems like even kind of strange again, we would change it back within less than a year. So I, I'm gonna just, you know, go by that this is, uh, this was a direction that the commission, you know, authorized, and I feel good about it because of that. Just with just 
can't go back and forth every time. Um, you know, and I definitely am sympathetic to the, um, um, what the community, community is saying, but it was it's just a couple, you know, I, I'm not judging by how many people are here, but it, I, unless there was like a, a lot of people I don't know about changing it back. Do you mind going back to the site plan? Um, so based on that, just, you know, looking at the, um, how it's set up now, w let me ask a question too, and I guess um, uh, the Herbie Yosato Court, is that why there's not as many more, well, that's a kind of a landscape buffer question, but um, um, it, I guess I, I was expecting the parking to be a little bit more developed, but uh, I don't know if there was any more recommendations from um, uh, having more green inside of it or anything. I, I don't, that's not the right question, but any islands, landscape islands? or The islands would be required if you go beyond 15 contiguous spaces. Okay. It's, it's felt like it needed it, but I, and it's pervious too. Um, so I, I, I can understand that. So, you know, honestly, based off of, um, you know, the way, oh, one more question <laughs> about uh, Marshall Street. So it's, it's supposed to connect to Joy, but that that's, is, that's where the right of way connects. And that's yeah. a long term plan. It's not connecting right now, or we will, this project will connect it. Well, currently it's unbuilt right of way, but it does connect from Lishy to Joy. Show the plans, it show the, the right of way on the map. On our, this is our parcel map, right? Yeah, so this is the parcel map, and you can see this site highlighted in red here. So this is Lishy, identified by the purple line, so mm -hmm. residential collector. The unbuilt right of way spans from Lishy to the east, as you follow the mouse, to Joy Avenue here. Jones. So it's Jones, Jones sorry. Um, so that's currently unbuilt right of way. It's, it's unbuilt, but part and so part of this project is only going to go to what was indicated on that. Um, yes, just to where the property line ends. Okay, and along there that was, right of way. And um, and right now there is no. Um, it's vacant land. Yeah, there, and there's no plan for, to extend it under public works. No, for me. not that we're aware of. No. Commissioner, I, I, you see the large lot that's shown there. The uh, big one, yeah. Yes, uh, I believe it's a nursery. It is. Yeah, it's a, right now. It's a 20 foot drop. So. Oh, it is? Yes. Okay. Along the side of this, yeah. is that what you're saying? I mean, it may be more than 20 feet. <laughs> But I, I know this property intimately. Okay. okay. So uh, one of our points would be is that this is about connectivity. That's why when uh, in whatever year this was originally platted and these subdiv this subdivision was created, uh, the Planning Commission, even at that time, understood the importance of connectivity in creating a street grid so that you don't end up with dead gridlocks dead and dead, lock, uh, dead ends. And so that's why it's shown and if you do any research on your property, you're going to see, you go down to, to pull your deed, you're going to see that that right of way is dedicated and has been since the time that this uh, subdivision was platted. So, um, okay, so that's, that's good to hear. I guess I'd like to see, even though I don't, I guess I haven't driven past it, so I don't know how about this drop off. But anyway, I, I would like to see it, the connect, connection happen, I guess. that Maybe that's where I'm going with it. Um, not just the right of way, but connection happen. That would make the... Why do this Say it one more time. Is that your point is why just do that? Yes, exactly. That's where I'm going. I guess I should have said that. I mean, yeah, why do just that portion? Let's just get it all done. And then that would help the uh, connectivity back to that since we're putting more density on that corner and, you know, just the connection will happen and it wouldn't just dump out onto Marshall Street. Um, but anyway, um, you know, based on all that, though, I, I'm in pretty much support of the plan for it. Um, I... I sympathize with the um, community, but it seems like it was a lot of steps to get here, and I don't know why maybe everybody wasn't, um, uh, didn't know about it, but it seems like it fits within the way that that area is developing. Commissioner Sims. I, I'm um, with Commissioner Tibbs here. Um, just as disclosure, I used to own this piece of property about 10 years ago, so I know this inside out. And we tried forever to get a connector road here. 
And the problem is it backs into a huge nursery, and there's just not a way unless you go through somebody else's property. So this might be a worthy goal, but it's going to be a very expensive goal. So what's happening is we've got incredible density coming into a very small, what is basically a driveway, and it will be the other side of Marshall, and I commend the people who are trying to think about how to build that road. But that's just picking up on where Tibbs is. I've got several other questions. Um, one is, I know that there was a proposal to rezone part of this to R6. Where are we with that? I know it got, it, it came in front of the commission and then it's gotten deferred, I think. Well, R6 or R6A, I don't know, remember which one, but. Yeah, I mean, it's out there somewhere, so. I'm not sure what. Yeah. There's part of this whole area that what is in the process request? of getting rezoned to, well, it's requested and then it got deferred. I, I was asking where the proposal was that we actually had with R6. Um, we may be able to ask that of Miss mm -hmm. Davis. Yeah, I, I she keeps up with this stuff. <laughs> Hi. There is currently a pending case that is just to the west of this uh, property, yeah. and it's a proposal to rezone various properties to um, MULA along Trinity, to RM20A uh, near Dickerson, and then to R6A, and that is was deferred and is on the agenda for in December. Yeah, okay. And my concern is I almost feel like we need to wait to see what happens there because um, that's going to impact, a, this doesn't become just an SP, it becomes more than that once the whole area begins to look more dense. So that's one of my concerns is what we have to take into consideration what's going on with that R6A um, request. The other uh, is, um, I didn't know you could waive public notice. And so when somebody, when we waive public notice to go to neighborhood associations, a lot of the neighbors I know for a fact did not get notified. And I spend a lot of time with neighborhood associations and one of the things about associations, God bless their heart, is most of them are dysfunctional. A lot of them are dysfunctional. And so there's pockets of neighborhoods. I mean, you don't have just one association representing this whole area. You have multiple neighborhood associations, and I saw where the planning association met with many of them, but in the absence of some type of notice, unless you just happen to plug into a neighborhood association, I don't know how you actually get notified. And so I'm concerned about how we waive that right, and I guess the council has that right, but I never heard of it before. Yeah, the, the rules and procedures, there are certain notification requirements for minor plan amendments and major plan amendments. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Director Sloan mentioned earlier, our, our resources are limited. So in cases where we have large plan amendments that are requested, mm -hmm. um, we can request to you all that you waive your, your rules and, and procedures for notification requirements. And that request to waive the requirements came before you prior to the process for this uh, amendment. Trouble with having so many new people, I guess. <laughs> Most of our notices that we do that don't deal directly with zoning are uh, notices that we've chosen to put into our rules and aren't required by state statute. We do a lot more notice in public hearing uh, than is required by state statute. And I, uh, okay, the other question I have is, um, Um, when you take, I, and this is my research background, and I'm glad a new researcher joined here, is you can get any data point to say what you want, and that's particularly true in public policy. But part of really good public policy is to look at the aggregate, and I know that term would get thrown around a lot with us, but, and in this case, we have had an enormous amount of change come to a very small area, and I think it's actually less than a third square mile, and I wish I didn't have personal knowledge of this, I guess, but I do, that the neighborhood does not feel as engaged as you would want for this kind of incredible change. I, 
I want to support density. I clearly understand that I live in an urban area, that we're gonna to have to absorb much of this because we have to have moved to connector places. We have to increase employment centers. But when we have this kind of change, uh, what really governs a lot of this is um, what we call the Pareto factor. If too many people are getting hurt at the, for the sake of others, then the more imbalance that is, the worse the public policy is. And I think in this particular case, this SP is either too early or is not, a good, is not good for this neighborhood at this point, so I'm gonna have to vote no to it. Uh, so my questions were about the public notice also, and I just wanna double check that I understand this right. This commission waived the right, waived the, the requirement for the public notice. So uh, can somebody put the slide up with the um, neighborhood associations on it? I, I just, my big question was just, um, in those neighborhood associations, more or less how many people would have been notified? Are we thinking 20 people per association? These were held at their regularly scheduled uh, association meetings. So a wild guess to how many people were at each of these meetings, it, more or less, it doesn't have to be exact. 20 is a great guess. There were over 100 folks that participated in those meetings. But if we'd done the public notice, would have been 5,500 that would have been notified? Property owners, that's correct. Mm -hmm. That troubles me. I understand this whole point, and I really understand the need for infill and urbanization, but, um, and I sh wasn't here when we waived the requirement, and so I'm sure there was a good argument about that and why it was done, but I and find it really troubling. Right, and, th and that's the number of people who attended the meetings, uh, and, you know, and a lot of times you notify 5,500 people, they all don't show up. A mm -hmm. uh, hundred, in some cases, might be a good turnout. Um, but there was, and that was all presented as part of the, the, the waiving of the fee or, or of the notification requirement was that there was a website created, it was posted on the web page, emails were sent out through the neighborhood association, so it wasn't just you show up to the association meeting and you can uh, have a part in the conversation. There are other methods of getting the word out as well. Uh, okay, so that that's good. Let me um, dig into that just for a mm -hmm. sec. So you're saying that um, emails went out to a lot more people than actually ended up coming to these meetings. So that maybe the there were more like a thousand homeowners notified? I, yeah, I, I can't guess at this point. I'd have to go back through the files on it and get an exact number of how many emails were sent out, but and what more we're than the 100 folks that, that showed up were notified. Okay. And that notification is about um, the change from uh, to neighborhood evolving, not anything about this particular permit. No, it, it was a larger area. It's about 270 acres that were considered in this major plan amendment. There were a couple of pieces of neighborhood center as well that were zoned for neighborhood center type uh, uses. So there was neighborhood maintenance to neighborhood evolving as well as to neighborhood center, from neighborhood evolving to neighborhood center. Okay, I wanna listen to everybody else. Councilman Bedney. No pressure there. <laughs> Why is the setback on this one so different than the surrounding properties? The front setback. The setbacks are consistent with policy in that we call for reduced and short setbacks between structures uh, in T4 um, involving policy. So we felt that what was shown was appropriate and consistent with policy. But it's dramatically different from every, I mean, I, would, I fixed two houses there with rebuilding together in Nashville, actually a house right next door to it. And I remember that street has very clear setbacks that go way far. I mean, you can look at it at the picture. So th this is going to be a drastic change to the yeah. to the feel of the street. 
And with evolving policy, we often expect adjacent properties within that um, same policy area to redevelop at some point in the future and not so distant future. That's why we often see um, different setbacks than our adjacent properties that haven't yet redeveloped. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I ask a question to Mr. Morton? Yeah. Yes, you may. Mr. Morton. <laughs> Are there any of these properties going to be dedicated for affordable housing? Like with a restriction on the deed? Restriction on the deed, we will be required to meet the current affordable housing requirements that are in place with Metro government. In addition to that, we're in conversation with the council member about specific affordability requirements on his behalf, um, requiring one or more units to have uh, specific uh, criteria established for affordability. I, w I would remind you that you know this applicant is really beyond the affordability conversation that's going to continue with the council member. Um, the desire to create workforce housing, a smaller footprint, smaller square footage, a more affordable rate than what you're typically seeing in this market is very much um, a priority and goal of this project. And so um, there's affordability, there's workforce housing. We all know that you know, everybody has definitions, but they're both very important, especially for this growing area where you're starting to see it difficult for people to remain in the area. But it's a doubling of the entitlement. I mean, each one of those houses is, I mean, we're talking about two extra million dollars mm -hmm. uh, sale on this property. So I, I was hoping if you could give me some specifics on what the, do we need to wait on the council member to provide that information? Uh, I met with him last week. Um, he's looking forward to continue the conversation. Um, we un th we've come up with some language that we feel could be supported. Um, it has to do with what we believe is a agreeable by fair housing. Um, he he wants a, he is looking for more of a set price, which you really can't do um, with fair housing. So. We're trying to work within uh, his wishes as far as for affordability to guarantee that whatever metric we come up with meets his goals and criteria for affordability. So we just haven't come to the final end game of what that is and how so it makes fair I guess I don't have an answer. I mean, I, we still don't know. At this time, we do not have specific affordability criteria established, but he will not move it forward at the council without it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Okay. So we've gone full circle. Um, I mean, I guess one point that it does occur to me, I mean, when we talk about so many of the conflicting or competing um, demands that we're looking at with, with Nashville Next, um, affordability is a key point. And when you look at the those lots, um, you know, most likely if they were put together and re-subdivided, you'd have three large lots and those homes would be selling for $750,000 each. So, you know, from an affordability perspective, that's a big change. Those are, that's no affordability. So I just think, you know, we do need to consider all of the different priorities that we have. Mm -hmm. um, Councilman, you will have another chance to, to review the affordability once it comes to council. Um, but I'm also very sensitive to, to a lot of the concerns. I'm sorry, sir, the public hearing is closed. Um, so, I guess. It's up to someone to make a motion or further discussion. Mm -hmm. I'm not, because you're that way and I'm facing more of you. <laughs> I gotta look this way. Let me say one thing. Sure. I just want to thank Ms. Davis and Mr. Harmon. I, I've never seen two people try so hard to protect a 5,000 member neighborhood, and I'm so proud of you for that, regardless of what the decision is up here. I don't, okay. <laughs> so we need, we need some kind of a motion, or I mean, if well, there's. I'll, I'll make it based on my, I, I make motion to um, approve uh, staff recommendation. Do we have a second? Can I second? I'll second it for the sake of discussion. So discussion on this? Um, I won't vote for this as it is. Um, I don't think it's a bad plan. I think um, that there is too much density in the plan. Um, I'm not exactly sure if other commissioners would just rather um, vote it down regardless or whether there is the opportunity 
to see more work done on the plan. So, I, I mean, I say that for discussion among the commissioners. I, it's, it can do seven now, and that's that does both goals of trying to keep it more affordable as well as provide density without starting SPs off of this neighborhood. But they can't do seven because the lots are too, they'd have to, to put the acreage together and then resubdivide, correct, in order to meet, based on pure acreage. But to his point, based on, he'd have to meet the subdivision requirements. As an SP. Right. Yeah. Right, so seven units based solely on the gross acreage of the site. So we would still apply subdivision regulations and the minimum requirement of the zoning code um, if we weren't doing an SP, if we're just doing it under the existing zoning. So likely less than seven would be the result. Patrick, would you say three? Um, well, we have four lots now. So certainly okay. I, right. so I, would, leave it the I same. wouldn't see anybody going below that, what they already have. Okay. So. And the price would be around 750000 But you could do it SP at seven. I mean, to Commissioner Sims' point, I mean, there's a way to decrease density from where it is now. Um, um, certainly they could revise a plan, um, and we would review that, sure, for the SP. And, and what about Marshall Street? Is that, is that a done deal? Does that have to be in there? I mean, if that's the if the argument. Well, if, is okay. So if you're if you're revisiting the plan altogether, then no, it, it doesn't have to be. But again, uh, so there's a lot of elements in Nashville next, and connectivity is certainly one of them. And where you have right of way that's been dedicated for decades yeah. on the, the the parcel maps, shown anytime someone buys a property in the area to not expect that connectivity to happen next to a lot that size, I think it's short-sighted, but no, it doesn't have to be on there. Okay. So, okay. So, uh, to Doug's point, um, that connectivity cannot happen though without buying more property. It, no, that property is already dedicated and is already in it, it is. That, that's why it's on the map. It's shown as right away dedicated to the government of Davidson County. Well, there's a house sitting right behind it and then the drop off for the but nursery. If the house is there, then it was probably, if it's within, can you go to the parcel map again? Um, maybe the aerial might be helpful. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this so, can't do this. Well, yeah. that's that is ownership. That's who that Marshall Street shown on this map is the property of Davidson County. And, uh, and, and if someone has built something on it, then they have done that improperly. And technically, Public Works could do it, right? I mean, if yes, that was if you property. build a, your fence. Uh, on the public right of way, which happens periodically, mm -hmm. uh, and they come to widen the road, then your fence goes down. Can you go to that satellite map you were at, sure. the bigger one? I don't know. The, no. I think it had some red dots on it a minute ago. Yeah, there we go. Oops. And that it. Oh, that one's what I'm talking about. 22? Slide 22? There you go. One of those is the house right there. Yeah, and then, this, the yeah. And then this is a big hole right here. So, yeah. Well, anyway. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I guess I'm wondering if if there is enough going on that would warrant a deferral versus an up and down vote, or? Well, can I say one more thing about uh, something that Commissioner Sims has brought up? Uh, Commissioner, at the time that uh, these subdivisions were filed and approved, I doubt very seriously they had the ability to do aerial photos like this yeah. and the knowledge of where a hole is. But you may be pointing to the very reason why it's never been built yeah. uh, and that it might not ever well, actually go it. all the way through. <laughs> uh, and that's the kind of information that oftentimes we find out in these public hearings that the goal and what we see on a map that looks like a, a way for connectivity to happen isn't realistic because of realities on the ground that we're just not aware of. Yeah. 
And again, I just want us to go back to good decision-making processes when it comes to public policy, because unlike some things in subdivision or in other areas, rezoning, particularly with SPs, is not something that's guaranteed to anybody. And in this particular case, the aggregate requires so much careful thinking. And then we do have that request out there in December for R6, I don't know if it's R6A, R6A, R6. And so looking at each data point as we've been asked to do isn't giving us an opportunity to consider it in the aggregate. <coughs> and so I just feel strongly that this is setting a precedent that is not good for neighborhoods. And so, Commissioner, if I might, just because you've expressed some concerns about the broader policy and how we weigh those issues, I think the aggregate is important, but, and that's one sort of data point, but what you see here is the long-range growth and preservation map. And when we went through the National Next process, there was a lot of deliberative thinking about existing infrastructure, where growth is appropriate based on those existing roads, um, public amenities, public facilities. And so we took both the macro perspective and looked at what each individual community needed, but we also looked at broader community planning goals. And so it's this framework here that I think gives you the, um, gives the planning commission the framework that it's looking for to make sure that its decision making is holistic. I agree that aggregate numbers in a quarter mile or whatever definition you want to give is an important data point. But the second piece of that is the infrastructure. And that is what I think has been central to many of our discussions. And again, when this growth and preservation map was put forward, infrastructure was part of what we would imagine. I think this is four miles or something from downtown and it is um, currently served by bus service. And so all of those amenities and that framework um, is part of what hopefully would reassure the commission that we're making holistic decisions about where growth is important. The alternative to having a approach where you put density along corridors is to do more greenfield type development where you're spreading development across the city and county. And there are untold costs. We tried that in the 70s and 80s. And planning as a profession has learned a lot about whether or not that works. And I, I know I'm speaking at a big picture level. But again, I think, I just want to say that the framework that we are seeking for determining where growth is appropriate has been defined by this big picture perspective. And then we always have to peel the onion and do more. Um, but many of those decisions have been weighed here through this process. And I agree with that, Lucy, thank you. The question here, though, is that this is the last seven or eight, de six decisions for sure, this is the seventh, we've got the eighth coming, are making exceptions to the Nashville Next plan that was done with this kind of serious overlook. So I'm not understanding the exceptions to the plan. Well, or? we're adding a lot more density, for example. Well, a lot of these are SPs that we did in the neighborhood. So the plan, you know, as we've discussed, National Next is a living document, and it's something that is meant to be responsive to on-the-ground conditions. And so when this particular uh, policy was changed um, earlier this year, when the Planning Commission approved that policy, that then became incorporated into Nashville Next. So when we approved the original Nashville Next plan with the growth and preservation map, that was a citywide framework. As we go through each policy amendment, it's weighed against both the needs of that community, but also against broader um, public needs. And, and our decision making has to come from the community. It's community driven, as this was, as was um, the individual policy changes that go back into Nashville Next if that makes sense. Yeah, it's just a lot going on in this small neighborhood with a lot of changes over, right now, it looks like over 550 residences in a, a third square mile. Um. Although one, I guess one point relative to some of the other things we're seeing, at least this one we have a sense of what the design, we're not just looking at a straight rezoning. We're looking at 
a site plan. So I mean, I'm actually, you know, we've had a lot of discussions in this specific neighborhood and a lot of them have made me nervous because it's like we have no idea what's coming. Now we have a site plan. We know, you know, we've got some control over that. To Commissioner Blackshear's point, maybe the density isn't quite right. Maybe we need to go back and, and reevaluate that. And that's something, you know, I, my understanding was part of the reason that they went to this density was because they had to compensate for the cost of putting in Marshall Street. Well, if Marshall Street maybe isn't the factor that, it, I, you know, I don't know, but that might be a reason for them to go back and reconsider the plan. Um, you know, that would obviously have a major impact on the site plan if they didn't access Marshall Street. Um, so we still need to vote, but we also, can we have the applicant? If you have a question for the applicant. Yes, you look like you were ready to come and, would you want to consider a deferral or would you prefer an up and down vote tonight? I think we would love to consider deferral, but we would kindly request a little bit more uh, detail on the considerations from this commission because, um, again, just we, we were hired in April of this year, three months after this policy was in place to study the policy that was in place. We weren't involved with changing the policy in January, but um, we were hired to study the policy and to recomm give recommendations to our client about what would be appropriate to ensure all the policies, the goals in that policy were met, you know, affordability, access to transit, all those things. And so we've worked since April to ensure that that happens. And so um, again, we, we meet policy uh, according to staff, the policy that's in place today. Um, we absolutely have, you know, gone through the process that we think that you guys want. We respect the community and their input, you know, their opinions and input. We respect this commission and the decisions it makes and the input it gives us. But um, we would love to have a little bit more insight on what specifically we would need to address on a deferral um, because we feel like we, you know, we meet policy and, and you know, we would like to work with them, you know, to understand what it doesn't meet policy-wise. Great, thank you. So we need a vote. We have a motion on the table. Yeah, yeah can I ask one question? Quick? Sure. So um, if we wanted to decide to vote to defer instead, would we have to withdraw this motion? So we'll have to have an up or down, we'll have to vote, and then, and if it does not pass, then we'll have to have another motion. Okay, and then, um, could we base a deferral on the idea that we need more information on whether that street can actually continue? That could be one of the items. Because if that street can't continue, that changes the expense for the applicant and how much money then he can then, they can then spend on the units, right? Yep. I mean, I think that would be one of the items that they could it would factor into their site plan significantly. So I, I would vote this, I would just prove So wait, let's, so we'll take a vote on the first motion and then. I, I, uh, I would hesitate taking that vote just yet. I, the, the, you can withdraw the, I, it, I, 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 can, I withdraw my motion. Okay. Okay. Then I'll withdraw my second. Now we can entertain a new motion. He's pointing at my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> How many meetings do you need uh, to work out those uh, issues? Well, if I could step yes, in again. Sorry. I'm talking a lot more than I usually do tonight. Um, at, at, to uh, Mr. Morton's point, uh, and staff wants to know too, uh, what exactly is are the issues that the commission has with this development plan so that the time that we spend together can be more meaningful. Mm -hmm. uh, so I understand the, the issue regarding the, the street and I think that the realities of the topography are something that, that we need to explore a little bit more and now that we're aware of it uh, and, and that may wipe out the, the uh, desire to create connectivity where from an engineering standpoint it's not really feasible. Uh, it's, so clearly that's one of the issues. Are there others? Density for me. Is well, hold on, don't we, need, we need to get the motion, don't we? Before we get to this again? Uh, no, actually I'd, I'd rather have this discussion so the motion might articulate okay. exactly what it is that we're trying to accomplish. Density for me personally was an issue. I mean, obviously I don't have a magic number like el below 11 above four, um, but I definitely would like to see something, again, this is pr 
perhaps just my personal opinion, for something below 15. But that wouldn't be, in, I mean, we have to, we're talking about the, the policy, and so the density seems to match the policy, so yeah. I don't know that we can ask for less density. It's an SP, right? It doesn't have to be. Um, I mean, they're, they're getting more than what they would otherwise get if they didn't have an SP. Okay. So we can, we can ask for lower density, unless it, It's can. neighborhood evolving, so you, it contemplates uh, density above what you may see throughout the neighborhood now. But there's not a particular number to that density. It, it, then we look at how does it fit onto the property, uh, you know, does it meet some of our other goals about open space and... Mm -hmm. uh, well, I know affordability is not necessarily a requirement, but that will be something that will help me decide if this is a good trade-off uh, oh. in terms of assigning uh, higher um, entitlements to the property. So, so, so to that point, and I, I'm very glad you brought that up, you just gave us two competing goals, mm -hmm. to be clear. Yeah. You just told us to do some affordable, fewer units, but affordable. And those are competing goals. They are competing, but there is an equilibrium that we can try to achieve, and that's what I'm asking. Uh, okay. We will ever try to uh, succeed with that. Well, I'm, I was actually challenging the, <laughs> the developer. Commissioner Sims. And I'm not sure this is possible, but um, in this particular case, making sure that we reach out to the people most impacted up and down Trinity, because that's the place that's going to end up Lishi. I mean, Lishi, I'm sorry. Up and down Lishi in a very specific way, and, th and this is really to the developer. I, don't even, I think y'all have done a great job of reaching out to as many as you can, but to the developer, really reaching out to the neighborhood that is going to be specifically impacted by this SP. Okay, so we've got density, we've got uh, neighborhood, neighbor outreach, the and we've got the road consideration. Hopefully. Affordability. Any other items to Just add? Just in the spirit of um, counter things. Um, but uh, I'm not sure I want, I don't, I, I like the idea they're trying to develop this part of this Marshall. To get rid of it, I think, changes oh, yeah. a lot. So, um, But making it a private drive as opposed to building okay. up to yeah. complete public standards sure. is a very significant cost difference. Okay. Any other? While we're gathering a wish list. Okay, so would you like to restate your motion? Because I don't think we've quite gotten it. It's a motion to defer one to two meetings, two meetings? Well, I think two meetings uh, because uh, what I heard was an additional community outreach, so we'll need time for that. We are dealing with the holidays right now as we move into that time period as well. And so uh, two meetings, we'll move it to the first January. meeting in January. And I think that that hopefully will give us time to work with uh, Mr. Morton and and him time to go out and meet with the community. Okay. So we. Yeah, that sounds good. So a motion for a two to a three meeting, two meeting deferral, for those stated reasons. Yes. Uh, that's my motion. Okay. Second. Any other discussion? Do, do we want to clarify that there would be a, the public hearing would be open or closed? Reopen the public hearing. Okay, and the public hearing will be reopened. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, so. Oh, we're going to take a short 10 minute break before item six. <laughs> item number six, Lisa. <laughs> Commissioners, I will be presenting item number six for you. 
This is a request for a subdivision concept plan approval to permit up to 193 lots on property located on Brick Church Lane. As a bit of history and reminder for you, this was presented at the September 28th Planning Commission meeting. The public hearing was held and closed at that time. Uh, you all chose to defer to provide an opportunity for additional community conversation. Um, there have been community meetings held since the deferral hosted by the council member. Staff is recommending approval with conditions of the subdivision concept plan. The property shown on this map, outlined in red, is located on the south side of Brick Church Lane, east of and adjacent to Interstate 24. The property is located north of Briley Parkway and is immediately adjacent to property utilized for the FedEx ground distribution operations. The property is currently zoned R10, one and two family residential zoning which is intended for medium intensity residential development. The property has been zoned R10 since 1973. Surrounding zoning includes R10 to the west, R10 and RS20 to the north, and IWD to the south. I have highlighted some of the um, surrounding zoning districts so that you can get a better um, idea of the zoning. The lightest color yellow is the larger area of RS20. The area in yellow, including this subject property, is R10. And the property to the south in blue is IWD. The applicant is proposing to develop this property under the existing zoning entitlements. No rezoning is requested, nor is a rezoning required to develop the property as such. The Planning Commission is granted the authority to review subdivisions through Tennessee Code Annotated. The Planning Commission is given the authority to adopt regulations governing the subdivision of land, the review of sub which this commission has done. The review of subdivisions is then based upon those adopted regulations. This is a technical review to confirm that the proposal meets the regulations as adopted by the commission. We often discuss policy when we're talking to the commission about various pro uh, project approvals. The relationship of policy to the subdivision regulations is different than the relationship of policy to rezoning requests. The subdivision regulations outline for the commission the uh, process by which different policies are affected by the subdivision regulations. For example, for T2 rural areas, there are rural character subdivision regulations that must be met. For T3 suburban areas, such as this area, conventional suburban subdivision regulations are the regulations that control the subdivision of the land. I want to talk a bit about the history of the policy of this property, and I know that you can't see this map very well, and I'll zoom in in a moment. Um, this, the adoption of policy for property is a lengthy process. Um, the White Creek Bordeaux Community Plan, adopted as part of Nashville Next, included additional community conversations and input. The map before you is the map that the staff worked with the community on during the community engagement process. This is the map that was presented to the community as the final product during the community engagement process in 2014 and was presented to the Planning Commission in June of 2015 with the adoption of Nashville Next. Zoomed in on the map, you can see the property there, I've pointed to it with the red arrow, was indicated as neighborhood evolving at the time of the overall adoption of Nashville Next in June of 2015. There were 11 areas in Watts Creek Pike that were deferred during the overall adoption of Nashville Next. Those areas are outlined in blue. The property in question is indicated by a star. This map is the map that was shown during the adoption of the 11 deferred areas 
and he clearly shows the property in question as neighborhood evolving. This property was not one of the areas of further study beyond the initial adoption of Nashville Next. So I say all that to say that this property, as adopted with the overall Nashville Next plan, is neighborhood evolving, T3 suburban neighborhood evolving, with some areas of conservation located on the property as well. The area to the north is within a T2 rural policy area. To the south is district industrial. To the west, there are some areas of rural, uh, rural policy and additional neighborhood evolving. This swath of neighborhood evolving located between the T2 rural policy areas to the north and the district industrial policy areas to the south serve as a transition between these two policy areas. The area of conservation, primarily limited to the northwest corner of the property, indicates areas of steep slope. The subdivision process is a three-step process. The first step in the process is concept plan, the second is final site plan, and third is final plat. The, the item before you tonight is step one in this three-step process. The zoning code outlines the cluster lot option as an alternative option for subdivisions development. This is something that is permitted by right if the property is zoned as such, this property is. The zoning code cluster lot option provides for flexibility of design with subdivisions. It requires the creation of common open space and encourages the preservation of natural features such as steep slopes. To get the lot yield of a cluster lot option, 15% of the gross land area is subtracted from the total to account for infrastructure. The remainder is divided by the required zoning lot, in this case 10,000 square feet. The lot yield, maximum lot yield for this property is 242 lots based on the cluster lot provisions. Based on the cluster lot provisions also, lots may be reduced in size, the equivalent of two zoning districts. For this case, it would be 5,000 square feet. And perimeter lots fronting an existing street must be 90% of the zoning requirement, or 9,000 9, square feet in this case. The zoning code further uh, goes into requirements on hillside development. The zoning code states that single family subdivisions in areas that have 20% or greater slopes are encouraged to utilize the cluster lot provisions. In general, lots shall be clustered on the portions of the site with natural slopes of less than 20%. The proposed plan includes 193 single family residential lots utilizing the cluster lot option as encouraged by the zoning code. The lots range in size from 6,000 square feet to 9,000 square feet. The plan proposes two access points to Brick Church Lane and two stub streets to provide for future connectivity should adjacent properties develop. The connectivity is one of the goals of the policy. All lots front onto public streets and sidewalks meeting Metro standards are provided throughout for the prop and for the property frontage along Brick Church Lane. The cluster lot provision requires that 15% of the development be set aside in open space. The proposal sets aside 22.7 acres of the site area, or 34%, into common open space. Recreational facilities are required in cluster lot, cluster lot subdivisions, and they're required to be provided within usable open space. A development of this size with this number of lots would require two recreational facilities per the zoning code. This development is providing a sitting area, horseshoe court, playground, and dog park exceeding the requirement of the zoning code. Additionally, a natural walking trail is being provided in the large northwestern portion of the site. As you'll recall, this is the portion of the site with the conservation policy, which they are setting aside into common open space with a natural walking trail. A sea level buffer is provided along the perimeter of the site as well. 
In reviewing the subdivision, staff reviewed the uh, proposal against the subdivision regulations. The plan meets the subdivision regulations. The plan meets the cluster lot provisions of the zoning code. It provides common open space and places areas of steep slope into the common open space. Additionally, a traffic study was submitted by the applicant and reviewed and approved by the Public Works Department. Therefore, staff recommends approval with conditions. Thank you, Lisa. So the first item for us, um, as, as she mentioned, this was heard on October 26th, and at that time we closed the public hearing. So um, the first item for us to consider is whether or not we want to reopen the public hearing. Um, so I need a motion from the commission um, if we're going to go forward with, with reopening the public hearing. I move to reopen the public hearing. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Great. Any other discussion? Motion carries. So we will go ahead and reopen the public hearing. <laughs> um, so the applicant will have 10 minutes. The applicant here. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, Jim Murphy of the Bradley Law Firm, on behalf of the applicant, uh, my address is 1600 Division Street. I'm going to turn this over uh, to Adam Seeger of Dale Associates, the engineer, to make some comments. I'll follow up and then we'll reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you all. My name is Adam Seeger with Dale and Associates, 516 Heather Place. Uh, appreciate everyone here. Um, just going to repeat a few items, kind of bullet point it, um, kind of what we've heard, and uh, kind of go back over all of the points that were mentioned. This is a straight zone subdivision. It is R10. It does meet the policy in the area. Um, like was mentioned, there are 242 lots that are allowed under the calculation for a cluster lot. We're proposing 193 on the plan that was submitted. Um, I want to reiterate that this property is bounded by other R10 zoning, industrial property and the interstate on the right side. Um, all departments have recommended approval. We've worked with staff, uh, fire, public works, stormwater, natural water services, planning, and, and everyone and everyone recommends approval. Um, one of the reasons why this was deferred last time was to engage the community. While straight zone subdivisions aren't required to hold public uh, meetings, we have attended two community meetings on this. One was done before the last meeting back in September. Uh, the most recent one was held on November, November 4th. That's this past Saturday. That's uh, the two that we have attended. Um, you may hear things about traffic. Um, I, I don't know what we're going to hear, but one is probably going to be traffic. Uh, last time when this was brought before the Planning Commission, the, the counts were in question, so we went back and studied that. Uh, the counts were made in March of 2017, and um, the road was not closed during the time of those counts. That was confirmed. And just to be doubly sure that we got that right, the traffic consultant went back out in October during school, uh, road was very much open, recounted the entire road, and all of that data came back to be the same as what was really already in the uh, traffic study. So the differences were negligible. Um, so all those traffic requirements still uh, apply. Um, I want to reiterate that the counts that were done on Brick Church Lane are very much a low volume road. Um, it's in comparison. It's, it's percentage-wise compared to some of the other two-lane roads in Davidson County. Uh, site distance was mentioned. We have further studied site distance. That is something that will need to be met at the final site plan process. Nonetheless, just to be clear, we have studied the site distance now, and we uh, exceed the site distance requirements at each access of the, the subdivision. We are doing above and beyond improvements um, that uh, more than what the traffic, the traffic report requires. And so those are a few of the things um, I just wanted to reiterate. And um, I think that's all I have for now. I'll reserve the rest of my time to um, answer any questions later on and turn it back over. Thank you. Thank you. 
Again, Jim Murphy, and I'll be very brief so that we can hear from the uh, neighbors who I'm sure have comments. Um, I've provided you with a letter that states the law in this area. Um, you've got to have um, evidence that indicates that uh, this, plat, this plan doesn't meet the subdivision requirements. Uh, the fact that it doesn't meet the concept plan or it should be zoned differently or it should be policy differently, all those things are irrelevant for purposes of uh, determining whether this plan meets the subdivision regulations. Your only role here is to determine if, you, if this plan meets the subdivision regulations. Uh, most of what I was going to say, Ms. Milligan's already said, so I'm not going to repeat it, and we'll just uh, wait and hear the comments from the neighbors and then respond. Thank you. You're, you're going to hold two minutes for a rebuttal? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. I okay. thought I said that at the beginning. You did. Sorry. You did. Thank you. Okay. We'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Our, um, are there anyone here speaking in favor of this project? Anybody here speaking in opposition? And if I can ask that you please line up and um, you will each have two minutes. Please state your name and address. And I would just ask, given the, the volume of people that are here, um, please be considerate with your comments. Um, and if you sense that your neighbor has said something very similar, um, yeah, say, just let us know you support what your neighbors have said. Okay. Good evening, uh, commissioners, Director, Vice Chair Farr, Director Sloan, planning staff, everyone who's taking the time to be here today. I see I already have my five minutes, so I won't ask for that. My name is Jennifer Hagen Deer. I live in a 1965 ranch on five and a half acres on 681 Brick Church Lane, uh, approximately less than half a mile from this located property. Uh, it's a one mile rural two lane road. Uh, with a double line in the middle, a blind hill and a steep, and a curve and a steep hill. When it ices and when it floods, there's really no way out except to go to either Knight Road or Brick Church Pike. That's the only two lanes. So we're talking about putting uh, two entrances and then loading 190 homes onto a two-lane rural road that dead ends into two other main roads. Um, I understand the lawyers. I'm a recovering lawyer myself. Um, let me say, first of all, I really appreciate your time, energy, and attention. Reading our comments um, on behalf of our Whites Creek neighbors who are here tonight, listening to us and reopening the public hearing, we really appreciate that. Um, we think that our community voice is very important. We think the fact that we live here is a very big deal. And that just because a developer has a right to do something or can do something, they think they have a right to do something or they can do something doesn't mean they should do something. Um, and we really, uh, as you know, as a former commissioner, I know you have a long evening before you, so we're going to try to make this brief. And I have asked, all of our neighbors have discussed not repeating ourselves ad nauseum. I do want to go back, though, that this was originally on the consent agenda. And, you know, we have a staff report for a reason. You have a role here. Um, the staff re report makes a recommendation. The staff report does not make a dictation. The staff report provides you with the information you need to make a decision. And we're hoping that you do consider that decision very thoughtfully this evening. Um, we believe that this is improper for our area, that yes, the policy is incorrect and that it needs to be changed, but the policy is T3 neighborhood evolving because it slipped through. Because I don't know if you guys were around during Nashville Next. We were here a lot. And we were fighting about a lot of different things, not fighting, discussing, working, trying to get there. Planning staff was amazing. Put up with a lot from us, and always have. And we really appreciate it. This property slipped through. And you know why it slipped through? Because someone lives right in the middle of that center right there. This is Night Drive. Brick Church Lane's over here. This is an overpass. There's industrial, and all of these are a minimum of four and a half acre lots. And this big piece of land surrounds one homeowner who's sitting here today, who's lived there their entire lives. And now they're gonna build 190 homes right around a homeowner and a grandmother and a family. The rest of the family lives across the street, a whole family lives down here, and I'm raising my two kids and my four dogs down the street. I never intended to live around 190 people coming out on a two-lane rural road where people have had accidents, where a fire truck can't get down when, a, when an ambulance is in the road. 
I've got a neighbor two doors down who has a child with a heart condition who will have a heart transplant in her life. If it ices and it rains and those people need to get out, 190 families need to get out of there and need to go to night drive and try to get to the interstate or go to, Bri to Brick Church to try to get to Briley, how are we supposed to get an ambulance down there? So my understanding, this is not compliance with cluster lots. This is not free, usable space. Walk this property. Have you walked the property? Have you driven down Brick Church Lane? Come walk in our shoes, come live in our neighborhood and talk to me about subdivision regulations. I'm sorry, this should never have been T3 neighborhood evolving, this should be T2, and we fully intend to come back and seek an amendment to the policy. We have our council person here who supports us and our council person who's also against this development. So this development can be approved and go forward, we're going to court regardless, because this ain't gonna happen in our neighborhood. This is a developer who doesn't live here, they live on big lots in other areas, and they make these tiny little lots in our rural neighborhood. And if you come and look, this is the neighborhood. Not the big aerial footage you saw on the other side of Brick Church Pike. We're not saying you shouldn't develop. That's where the development goes. There are over 800 homes in our community right now in the pipeline. And we have two lane rural roads. We have a church, two churches, and two schools within a half mile of our house. And they don't have sidewalks on Brick Church Pike. The infrastructure is insufficient to handle this. This road is insufficient, and this does not belong in our community. I'm here just to tell you that. They're gonna ha handle the issues of flooding and all the other things, and guess what? If it complies with subdivision regulations, you do what you gotta do. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners, staff, vice chair. Uh, my name is George Ewing. I live at 4601 Whites Creek Pike, a little distance off this map. We did see earlier some maps showing uh, uh, R10 abutting this. I'd like to point out that uh, north and west of this, there is a small triangle that is in, under policy T3NE. The rest of the properties adjacent to this are T2 and protected into different subdivision regulations. I wasn't gonna speak on Nashville Next. I had a whole lovely speech about comparative density where uh, the existing properties on mile long Brick Church Lane come out to about 16 acres per unit. The 193 lots is about 50 to 75 times more dense than the existing block pattern that's here. The T3NE serves a purpose in connectivity in suburban areas that are meant to be developing towards more urban areas. And this is not that, it doesn't have the connectivity, it's bracketed. The little triangle next to it is the only other thing near it that's T3NE. I'd like to speak a little bit um, about the Metro Planning Commission staff reports from Nashville Next. Five rural workshops were held in Whites Creek community. At the Nashville Next public hearing on June 15th, 2015, several attendees voiced opinions. Some of them being rural, rural policies should be applied to the entire Whites Creek study area to help preserve the rural area's character. Another comment, rural policies should be applied to these areas to be harmonious. Another comment, rural policy conflicts um, with the surf suburban zoning and should displace it. Another comment, applying suburban policies would be detrimental to the rural character. So for many white, this is from the planning staff. For many of the Whites Creek community members, there are strong opinions that all character policies in the area should be rural to reflect the character of Whites Creek and the community vision to preserve and maintain the area as a rural. There was a lot of focus on those 11 areas. It was a very busy time. Planning was awesome. It is hard for people to have time to come and be a part of this community planning, and they were. And they're here again. So I thank you for your time and for listening. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Trey Sutherland. I live at 631 Brick Church Lane. Uh, uh, Matt, it's like the brother's one back off of the uh, the map right there. And uh, I guess um, we, d we didn't get any type of uh, notification that any type of, uh, you know, subdivision was being planned or anything like that. I found out about two weeks ago. I went to the Saturday, last Saturday's uh, hearing and, uh, you know, they got up, there, got up there and talked about, like, you know, everything's done, you know, we're all this, that, and the other, and, you know, it's uh, disappointing that uh, you, you, you come and you get kind of backdoored on a, uh, you know, a family's been living there forever, and they're going to surround them with all them homes and this, that, and the other, and, um, you know, it's just, uh, I oppose it, and uh, I wish that y'all would do the right things and, and keep our community rural, because, I mean, as you can see by the map, we've lived there our whole lives and everything, and we would uh, like to keep it, it the way it is. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> 
Good evening. Thank you for your time. My name is Angela Williams. I live on a family farm started in 1787 at 7203 Old Hickory Boulevard. I'm the ninth generation to live there. Wedge Creek is truly historic and rural. And uh, we are not anti-development. We are pro-rural character. Um, I was one of the organizers of the Nashville Next in our community. And uh, 98% of the people, over 500 people showed up to that in our small community. 98% said we want to remain rural. That is the wish of our community. So how do we pull this off with having um, something with straight suburban north of Briley Parkway? Briley Parkway is really the, the corridor that separates suburban, welcome suburban development, and then you know coming out into the rural area. Just off of this um, piece alone, uh, the old Hodges um, has proposed 100 units. Uh, the Thornton Grove has, has approved 550 units in Old South, which we fought vehemently because it came in before Nashville Next. It was probably the whole reason that, that Whites Creek went bananas over Nashville Next and had the most attendance at any of the meetings was because we didn't want what they were selling. But they had already gotten in, it was their right, all that kind of stuff. So. So if you, if you count them up right now, there's 750 units planned in a one and a half mile radius of that. That is not our community's wishes. Our wishes are to remain rural, rural in character. That doesn't mean not developing, that's rural in character. This clearly is not rural in character. And, and we need your help and, and your support to maintain the integrity of our community. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Marie Hudson, and I live on 534 Brook Church Lane, and I'm 89 years old, and uh, my family has lived on the property since the 1890s, and I um, am against it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Wesley Hudson. I live at 527 Brick Church Lane, which is directly across the street. I'm going to read notes because I get emotional about it if I don't. Uh, thank you all for volunteering and your patience and all these matters that you deal with every day. Um, I know White's Creek comes up a lot in your meetings lately because it's one of the last rural refuges in Nashville. Uh, the house that we were raised in, that my mother lives in, is a hundred year, over 100 years old. Um, Bird Church Lane is an established small rural community that's a part of the bigger Whites Creek community. Um, it's always been pretty much far, either past been farmland or was even still farmland. My brother and I have kept cattle. We've cut hay on the neighbor's property to feed the cattle. Uh, it's not an area of transition. It is a stable, historic rural community and it's not just an empty space begging to be developed. Uh, as some of the others have said, the properties have owned, been owned by families for generations and generations. We're in our sixth generation there with four generations living on the property at this time. Uh, we never did understand how it got pulled out and cut out of the Nashville Now plan and changed, and I'll be the first to tell you I'm not smart enough to understand T2, T3, T4, whatever. It was always agricultural to me. That was the zoning it was supposed to be. That was what it was supposed to stay. But somebody decided they didn't want agriculture in Davidson County anymore. Um, I-24 Briley Parkway does separate that from the rest of the suburban developments around it. It's the line for White's Creek. If you look at everything uh, north and west of that, it's pretty solid. So I just ask for your disapproval. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My name's James Hudson. I'm retired from the Nashville Fire Department. And my family, like my brother said, has lived on this for six generations. Uh, this development does not fit in with the neighborhood. We've got other families that have lived there for generations. I'm not sure, but I don't believe anybody from the developer has actually walked that property. They've had aerial photos, but it does not show how rough that property is. The drainages, the bluffs, um, 
It's gonna send more water to my property. It's gonna send more water to FedEx. There's no way to drain it enough to keep it from doing that. Uh, there are many 80 to 200 year old trees on this property that will be gone. This is GSD, this is not USD. There'll be no street lights, no trash pickup. We have problems with trash dumped on us all the time now. The police and fire response will be longer for this dense of, dense of development. Uh, I know other people are gonna speak about traffic, but I just wanna say that you can do all the traffic studies you wanna do. Until you've lived there for 70 years, you don't realize how that curve and hill is. It's very dangerous. I move that we don't allow this development. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Chase Sutherland. I live at 605 Brick Church Lane. Uh, I'm the fourth generation to live there. And uh, they've talked about doing traffic studies, but those traffic studies don't really do justice to what I've seen, what I've been involved in. I totaled a car on, the, on my way home from work. Like, I mean, and we wanna add 193 more people. That's gonna triple, quadruple, even the wrecks. Uh, the road freezes over in the winter. It floods constantly. I mean, there's just no way that this type of road can support that type of growth, especially so rapidly. Um, there's so many things that, that go on. I have little cousins that are driving. I eventually wanna raise my kids in the same house I'm in. And I don't wanna put them in that danger that I had to go through and that I've seen many other people go through. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hello, my name is Stephanie McGee and I live at 627 Brick Church Lane. Um, and I want to thank you all for listening and being here and, and for our safety concerns. But I wanna address the Metro subdivision regulation, also the AASHTO regulation 3-92A. It states that all new metro roads must meet the site distance per subdivision, which is 140, which is 445 feet of site distance for 40 mile uh, an hour road. However, um, the new proposed roads that are gonna come off of Brick Church Lane, um, they do not meet this. Um, you should have information that we sent to you guys last night for pictures and also the Nashville planning uh, is, has done that, their name is on that. It talks about the minimum uh, uh, street and how it's not there. Uh, basically, the east road coming out on the top of the hill, if you're looking to the um, west, it has a 425 um, distance looking west. And then that same street, if you're looking to the right toward the interstate, it has only um, 266 foot distance. This does not fall within the 445 foot. Also, this exact street that they're proposing here is not across from Trail Hollow. It's adjacent, like diagonal, I should say, diagonal from it. Um, and if you go down to the bottom of the hill, the west road, where the curve is, it only has a sight distance of 364 foot. These regulations do not even fall within the required the requirement. Also, another guy on our street, lives at the inner street, Jason, his wife was in an accident also, totaled her car out as well. We have a total of about 20 homeowners on this, home, on this whole street right now. You got two that's totaled homes out already with this curve and this steep hill. Please, y'all, please. Again, like they've said, unless you've driven this, you don't know the dangers. Please reconsider. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Marcella Hudson, and I live at 527 Brick Church Lane, which is directly across right here. And my driveway comes out right at the top of the hill. Um, I would like to, I, first of all, I do appreciate everything that y'all do. Um, I would like to try to uh, address connect connectivity, which a lot of it has been already addressed, so I'll try to keep it quick. quick. I lived here, have lived here for 20 years. Um, the, again, this area is not part of the evolving area around it. Um, 
it looks like our street access is 24. It does not. You have to go down a long hill and up and come to Burke Church Pike and turn and get onto Briley. There is no access to 24. Um, oh. The other end, if you try to go out the other way, it's a good three mile drive on similar two lane country roads to try to access 24. Night Drive does not have access to Briley Parkway, my apologies. Uh, let's see, the, uh, every 7.30 every morning, I take my grand granddaughter to school on Brick Church Pike, just on the other side of Briley. It is extremely difficult to get out because it is uh, bumper to bumper traffic. It is a 40 mile hour uh, road there. Um, sometimes, anyway, sorry. This is a um, proposal is incompatible with the rural pattern. It is inconsistent with the general plans for con connectivity and I ask that you disapprove. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, my name is Elise Hudson. I live at 4601 Whites Creek Pike. Um, I'm obviously related to these folks. Um, I want to thank you. I just recently learned that you are all volunteers and unpaid, and I didn't know that all of the years, and oh my God. So thank you for that. That's amazing. Um, I want to say uh, I actually disagree with the guy who spoke earlier. I think you do have the authority to, to disapprove this. I think that's been proven about three to five a year. It's not very often, but you do have that two-point approval of not only the zoning, but also the policy and the community character, and there is a precedence for that. So you do have the authority, if you want to, and we make the case, to disapprove this. Also, there are only 20 homes on Brick Church Lane, 20, and you're about to add 200. You're about to add 10, or 20, yeah, 10 times more homes than exist today on Brick Church Pike. Um, the average density of that today, it's like 16 or 17 acre lots. If you add those in, it's just a little bit over one acre per lot. That's a dramatic change if this gets approved. So I'd also like to talk to you about the tree canopy because that's very important. Most, the vast majority of this lot is complete dense forest. I sent you guys pictures of that. The, the Nashville, the subdivision regulations, the code and the community character manual all talk about protection of cedar glades. There's a big area of cedar glade down exactly where that most dense area is. It wasn't listed as conservation, but it does exist and we had an arborist confirm it for us and walk the land last week. So with that, um, you know, they, those trees also provide a significant sound barrier to us for FedEx and the interstate. So if those go away, then the whole neighborhood is going to have more sound pollution. Mayor Barry has recently focused a big effort on tree canopy preservation. So we ask that you please take these things into consideration, look at this, and use your authority to disapprove. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, thank you all for allowing us all to be here tonight to talk to you about the proposed development. My name is Lisa Proctor. I live at 4129 Dry Fork Road. I don't live near the development, but I'm a uh, friend and neighbor to um, several of the people that do live on Brick Church Lane. Um, I wanted to give you a little overview of White's Creek if you're not familiar with our community. Possibly you are, maybe you're not. We have approximately 1,400 to 1,500 people that live in White's Creek. Think about that. We have about, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the number of houses. And we have 3,400 people in our community. If you allow 200 homes, and each home has two and a half people, that's 500 additional people in our community of Whites Creek 37189. That increases our population to 14.7%. Four, Down the pipeline, if we get 1,000 homes in Whites Creek at 2.5 per home, we're gonna have a 73.5% increase in population and we do not have the infrastructure for that type of rapid growth. That's what you need to think about. Rapid growth in a rural area. We have <clears throat> one traffic light. We have two lane roads. We have one gas station. 
We have no grocery store. We have a post office because we have 37189. And we have a bank and we have two restaurants. And we like it that way. Mm -hmm. I moved there 14 years ago, grew up in Goodlicksville, moved to White's Creek, and love it. So please do vote no in this proposal. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, Lisa Johnson. Um, Can you state your address? Your, I'm sorry. State your address. 4001 Ridgemont Drive. Okay. Um, I've been advised um, on good authority that I need to ask you all that a study to determine that if the if this property yeah, that if this property should be I apologize that a study to determine if this property falls within the foot footprints of the brick church mounds should be determined. Um, and if you're not familiar with what the brick church mound is, it was the last uh, major Mississippian period, the large, it was the last major Mississippian period archaeological development. Am I making myself clear? Probably not. I apologize. It's an archaeological mound, and it was the last one that was in Davidson County before it was destroyed by a developer. And it was less than a half mile away from this property. That's why it is known as the Brick Church Mound. And there are hamlets all through the area. Um, and there are artifacts and human remains that are most probably present beneath the service that need to be protected and preserved. And they are most, most probably there. And this needs to be monitored and looked at further before this, anything is done further on this property. Thank Please you. Please consider that. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Pete Luboff, and I live at 1211 Lowe's Lane. I just discovered something in this process. I, I became political through this. We discovered by mere chance that this was going on, that, that, that this development was happening. The notification system was really wrong, and it tracks all the way through the system to defending yourself or pre presenting your case. Notifications are terrible. The appointments get changed. Contractors put, leave out the old signs with dates that, when they've changed the dates. I mean, there's, there's stuff like that going on. I feel it's essential that you know, a mandate should be without the, the notification, you got nothing. You got nothing to work with. And, 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 it's in the favor of the of the the contractors. I think you'd have to look into that and come up with a really cohesive policy about how. That's the whole thing is that you know that you've got something going on, and you've got to want it. You've got to know to know about it to do to do anything about it. Thanks. You guys are great. Hi, I'm Deborah Watson. I'm at 657 Brick Church Lane, which is about 105 acres, and I want to just talk about the police department down there. Uh, I was. Uh, helping my son, my husband, and I were helping a neighbor put away a horse that had got out next door. And we got the horse put up, and as soon as we got the horse put up, um, it, it was dark. And I looked down to the road, and I see a car stopping with the headlights stopped and started shooting at us. Called the police department, and 30 minutes later, after they didn't show up, called them again. <laughs> The policeman comes out some, you know, probably about 30 minutes later, and he just said, you know, we don't have the police force in this area to protect y'all. He said, you should just, you know, try to get the license plate number. I'm thinking, you wanted me to run down this guy because we don't have the police department, but yeah, you want to put 190 something more families out there, and they came to support what we have. So this is a proud community, and this isn't right. My name is uh, Herman Sutherland. 
I live at 641 Brick Church Lane. Uh, this property here. I live there this whole area. My children, son here, daughter here, son here. I've lived on that property over 66 years. I remember when Brick Church Lane was a gravel road. But as of now, we still don't have shoulders on it. And it's very narrow. I mean, you get run off. There's cars run off the ditch every year when it snows in front of my son's house, when they make that curve. Ice will stay there during the winter because it's on the uh, north side of the hill and it's there maybe a week or so after the snow is melted everywhere else. I just want to say I am so concerned about the safety of the street and of all the people there because there's been numerous wrecks on the road. And I appreciate y'all's service and I would hope that you would vote against this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank y'all for listening to us. Of course. Uh, I'm Connie Sutherland, I'm his wife. Um, I've lived out there 48 years. I feel like I've been out there all my life. Um, it's very rural. I can tell you how rural it is because I got bit by a copperhead. So it's really a, in the country, we feel like. And um, we have ponds on the, on the land. But we also have, you know, we're just a proud neighborhood. And that hill, my grandson talked about getting hit. He was at the bottom of that hill where they're having their road come out of. And that they have a, um industrial thing and the truck was backing in so you have to stop because they're backing in and when you do someone come right over the hill and hit him in the back end and totaled his car so that's how bad it is there <laughs> you can't see when you go over the hill how bad it is either way when you go the other way towards our house it's the huge curve and I can't tell you, you can't keep a mailbox you're putting a mailbox up every day so mm -hmm. I'm telling you and, and it floods across the street and, and the brick church that he's talking about has no red light, and sometimes you have to wait. If you're going left, you have to wait maybe, you know, five minutes to even get out. And, it's, and then you're taking a chance because they're flying. It says 40 miles an hour, but they're not doing 40 <coughs> miles an hour. So I was pleased with shock with reconsideration and help us out. Thank you. Thank you. Hello again. I'm Hello. Tim Watson. Uh, I'm uh, 657 Brick Church Lane, and uh, a lot of you may have seen me at Opryland for many years. I did 30 years with Gaylord out there doing shows for all of our tourists and on the General Jackson. Worked my butt off to buy 105 acres right across the street from this so I could live away from everything and not have a neighbor right up under me. And uh, I know most of you have that same dream. I hope you do. And uh, But I, I have, uh, in the last few weeks, within the last month, I had to cut a young lady out of a car that was upside down, had to cut a seat belt off of her because she flipped right in front of this property down here where the curve is. It's always wrecks there. I, I have to, I've had to call 911 several times to get people to have jumped a guardrail in that very curve right there. And uh, also, uh, I work with Kid Rock nowadays and he sent me a message to make sure I put in his disapproval about this too because he lives right behind me on the other side. And uh, the traffic is just, there's no way this little road can handle the traffic. And if you look at all the property out there, like I said, I've got 105 acres. Uh, Kid Rock's got 200 acres beside me. We moved out there so we would have big parcels of land. I hope Davidson County doesn't try to divide itself up so much that everybody's living on top of each other. It's already that way in a lot of parts of town. I looked hard to find a piece of property like that in Davidson County. It was a dump when I bought it. It had been dumped on for 60 years. You couldn't get through it with a four-wheeler. It now looks like a golf course. I worked my butt off on that property. That's why I don't appreciate developers coming in. I could develop my property. I have the right to. Don't mean it's the right thing to do. I wouldn't do it to my neighbors. So anyway, I just hope you will consider that. I know that may, I don't understand how this piece of property is even zoned the way it is because it's just one little piece that sticks up by the interstate. One little strip there. It's industrial behind it, and we're RS20. So anyway, thank you for your time. Appreciate you. Thank Consider. you. Good afternoon, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Jason Holloman, 4800 Charlotte Avenue, and I'm here today on behalf of the Hudson family. 
Uh, I do think it bears mentioning, even though I understand the staff report, I understand the applicant's comments, uh, that this has been identified as T3 Suburban instead of T2 Rural. But when you look at the actual character of the area, it is clearly a rural area west of Weiss Creek. When you look at this area and you look at the T3 and T2 definitions, you see that T2 Suburban is designed, or sorry, T3 Suburban is designed to create and enhance suburban residential neighborhoods, improve pedestrian and bicycle vehicular access. But members, in this area, you heard earlier today, there are only 22 homes along this mile stretch there. The average acreage per home, acreage per home is 16 acres per home. This is a proposal for seven units per acre. It's a dramatic swing. And when you look at adding the cluster lot option to this, you're talking about taking our 10 zone property, minimum of 10,000 square foot lots, and reducing that down even smaller. I thought it was 6,000, I was told it was 5,000. At that rate, I live in Sylvan Park, one of the most urban neighborhoods in the city. We have minimum lot sizes of 7,500 square feet. You're talking only two thirds of one of the most densely populated neighborhoods in our city is what we want to put on this 66 acre track. So with that in mind, how can you do what you're here to do and look at the subdivision regulations and disapprove this? First of all, I was here back in February when this body expressly at staff's recommendation disapproved on the sole basis of Tennessee Code Annotated 134203, which is also written into your subdivision regulations, that requires development to be harmonious development for the municipality. You can do it based on that. You can also do it based on not meeting the cluster lot requirements for open space as well as usable recreational space with the TVA easements, the stormwater, and the okay. steep slopes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Council lady. Oh. <coughs> yes, please. Okay. Hello, my name is Council Lady Brenda Haywood, and again to you, esteemed honorable people, I just um, I'm just grateful that you're taking your time to hear us tonight, and I don't take it for granted, nor do I take it lightly. Uh, there are many things that I could say, but I'm going to limit what I will say. Number one, of course, I'm the council person for District 3. I like to articulate that I'm a retired teacher. And as a retired teacher, if you look at the hierarchy of needs that PRJ put together, the number one need is for a person to feel safe, okay? And I'm also an ordained minister. I know that's really repulsive for some, but that's what I am, and I have to share that to make this next point. I heard um, Commissioner Sims say something earlier that I took to heart. She said, oftentimes, too many people are being hurt for the sake of some. And then I heard someone say that just because something is right doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. If you're coming down the interstate and if the limit is 70 miles per hour and you see a person, a dog, or deer, or whatever in the street, then you're just going to instantaneously slow down because at that particular juncture and at that time, 70 miles per hour would not be the right thing to do. So as an ordained minister, I feel like sometimes we have a moral obligation just to simply unequivocally to do the right thing. As far as Brick Church Lane, uh, many people talk about living there for an excess of 50 years, 60 years. We have a young man that's probably 27 years old. Well, I live probably, and don't quote me on this, but on a good day, I could walk to Brick Church Lane. I'm thinking right now, without the proper measurements, that I probably live one half, not less than a mile from Brick Church Lane. I live on Brick Church Pike. I cannot enumerate the number of times that I've traveled Brick Church Lane. Um, in that particular area, 
I was driving my car, one of the heaviest cars that you could possibly buy. It was a very heavy car. I was hit head on down there. My Mercedes was towed out and I was hospitalized in that very close to where they're talking about. Being a teacher, I'm often at Republic School. Right now, I'm attempting to get a light right there because so many of the parents and the faculty members, they contact me about the heavy traffic that's right there at Brick Church Lane. Very, very familiar uh, in terms of the accidents there at Brick Tur Church Lane. I've been down there, I've seen them. I've almost been involved in some of the accidents down there. You know, often, uh, well, several times you've had some of my constituents to talk about the number of acres that they have and how hard they've worked and what they have acquired financially. And I think that's fine, but my sensitivity does not lie there. My sensitivity lies in the safety of the uh, parishioners at the churches. My sensitivity lies in the people that travel that road, which with that steep hill is very, it's extremely dangerous. As a teacher, when we would have ice and snow, there are particular areas, primarily in Jolton, that the roads would be traveled, and there are several roads that would determine as to whether school would be let out or not on a particular icy or snowy day. Well, Brick Church Lane is one of those particular lanes that they use to determine as to whether we would attend school on a particular day. Because on any particular um, snowy day or what have you, it takes streets like Brick Church Lane much longer for the ice to evaporate. So I stand before you again with not as much sensitivity as it relates to someone owning in excess of 100 and so acres and working hard. That's very impressive, but that's not why I stand before you today. I stand before you due to the safety of many people that are put in harm's way. I feel like if this development, now I've talked to the developers which I highly regard and I highly respect, but I think there has to be a compromise. Am I pro-development? Unequivocally, absolutely. I'm for smart development. I just don't think this would be smart development. To show you how much I am in favor of development, my house sits on three and a half acres and I'd have to check with my husband, but I think we have eight or nine, we have ex, uh, acres uh, that are beyond the ones that we uh, that our house sit on, in excess of the, the acreage that our house sits on. I guess we probably, we don't have 120 or 2,000, but we probably have eight or nine acres other than the three and a half. And I would love one day to build the mini houses for the homeless. That's what, that's, I'm, I'm very ambitious, you know, one day when I'm not on the council, you know, I'm very interested in the homeless. I'm not interested in sitting in the middle of thousands and thousands of acres, but it, to each its own. But again, if I have a concern at all, my concern is the safety of my constituents, the safety of the children that attend schools in my area. So I leave with you um, the fact that, again, I admire the builders, the engineers. Um, I admire the expertise, the intellect that it has taken. I have taught uh, young people that have become developers and engineers. So um, it's, that's very impressive. But above all, I would like to stand here as the District 3 <laughs> council person to say that as it stands right now, I would love for the record to show that as it stands right now, I am vehemently opposed. Thank you for your time and your patience. Thank you.
Anybody else speaking in opposition? If not, we'll have two minutes for a rebuttal. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the commission. Again, Jim Murphy, uh, 1600 Division Street. Um, what we've heard from the neighbors are expressions of fear and concerns about the development. Uh, there were no facts that support uh, a, a finding that this plan doesn't meet the subdivision regulations. The issues that were raised about regarding the AASHTO standards have, have in fact been addressed in the conditions of approval. As uh, Mr. Sager mentioned, uh, the engineers have determined we can meet the site distance requirements and that has to be done when the final plat is submitted. If the final plat doesn't meet the site distance requirement, then you won't approve the final plat. You can't approve the final plat because it doesn't comply with the regs. As regards to archeology, span the uh, burial mound issue, uh, if human remains are found on the property, there's a state statute that deals with how you deal with that. Um, flooding, obviously, at the final site plan, we will submit uh, plans that will show that it meets the stormwater regs. If it meets the stormwater regs, it's not gonna cause flooding on around surrounding properties. And the same with trees. If there are trees that are preserved, the zoning ordinance deals with how you deal with preserving trees, and that'll have to be met at the final site plan. Finally, uh, in response to Mr. Holloman's comment about the development not being in harmony with the, with the um, community, if it meets the subdivision regulations, it's in harmony with the development of the community. There's multiple cases in this state that say that governmental bodies cannot uh, deny an application that meets regulations on the grounds that's out of harmony with the community. So for those reasons, this plan should be approved. Thank you. We're here for questions if you have any. Great, thank you. All right, Councilman Benday, are you volunteering to go first? Well, I was, I'm new here, so. Please. I, I just wanted to see if I can call Mr. Hollerman back in because I didn't understand what he was trying to say. Is that acceptable? The so it's up to the commission if we would like to give him uh, a stated limit of time. Uh, I just wanted him to clarify because okay. I, I, because he was cutting half, uh, because sure. he was very very eloquent. Sure. So. I'm not used to the two minutes yet. So yeah. <laughs> so I appreciate it. Uh, I, I promise I won't abuse this. Uh. <laughs> Sure, I think there's two points. Um, the, the first point that I was making was that this commission, uh, and I think this is just where Mr. Murphy and I disagree, this commission has, as recently as February, uh, at staff's recommendation, disapproved a subdivision which otherwise met regulations on the basis that it was not a harmonious development compatible with, with the community. And here you have such a stark swing in the built environment versus what is proposed. Again, you're talking about one unit per 16 acres on average in this mile now. And this would take the overall average down to one acre. And these homes, as you know, would be seven units per acre as built because of the reduction for, for cluster lots. That's point one. Point two, where I believe that you do have the authority, is that they have asked for this not as a straight subdivision for 10,000 square foot lots, but actually half of that in the downward departure for cluster lots. There are certain criteria that they have to meet when they ask for this to be subdivided as cluster lots. They have to meet 15% common open space, and they have to uh, put in recreational facilities that are on usable open space. And we don't believe that those two criteria have been met. Um, the, the, the spaces that they reserve uh, are largely taken up um, by floodway floodplain. You have a huge TVA easement that crosses this property, which as you know is essentially unbuildable. They also uh, are having to carve out for roads and stormwater detention. All of those things are part of what they've counted. So we don't believe that they reached the 15% uh, reservation to be eligible for cluster lots. And so on that basis alone, I think that you have the authority to disapprove. Okay. And beyond that, all recreational facilities have to be usable. A lot of what you see where that walking trail is, is on steep slopes of 20 to 25%. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
Yes, I think if, if the applicant would like to respond. May, to I, may I make one more point to you? If, if, very, okay. very, very, very briefly. Well, I, I, I want to point out that in terms of your discretion, you do have a variance procedure, and typically that variance procedure deals with applicants asking for more, but your variance procedures don't articulate that. Your variance procedures specifically say that you can grant variances if it is appropriate because it is oppressive to a certain area. Okay. And I would argue that in this case, a variance should be granted to accommodate the fact that you have an area that its built character um, is entirely rural. Okay. And, and this development would be so dramatically different than that that it is appropriate for a departure under your okay. variance criteria. Thank you. So we will give the applicant a moment to respond. Thank you again, Adam Sager, Dale and Associates, 516 Heather Place. Uh, real quickly to address a couple things Mr. Holloman said about the cluster lot provisions. We are meeting all of the provisions within the cluster lot uh, portion of the zoning ordinance as staff has mentioned. There was a mention about floodplain. There is no floodplain on the property. Uh, as you heard earlier, there are slopes on this property. That means we're higher up in the hills. There is no floodplain on the property anywhere. There is a requirement for open space in the cluster lot provision. That is to be 15% of your property area. Currently, as you can see on the plans, we're showing 34%. So we are more than doubling the amount of open space that's required in the cluster lot provision. The cluster lot, or the open space is then further broken down into passive and active. Um, both of them count towards it. Yes, we are using a portion of this open space for buffers to surround the property. We're using it for stormwater treatment to control all the stormwater runoff. We are having a large passive area to prevent slopes. Uh, we're trying to incorporate the natural resources by incorporating a natural walking in trail through there for the community. And then in the active places, we're providing more, uh, out of the abundance of caution, providing more above and beyond uh, active facilities than what is required in the zoning ordinance. So I just wanted to make a clarification that uh, we have gone to great lengths to make sure we meet every uh, aspect of the cluster lot provision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, additional questions for staff or comments? Yeah, I'd like to hear from the staff what is their opinion about what we heard today, if, if that's okay with. Uh, opinion in regards to yeah, can, can you be more specific? Uh, yes. Uh, well, the, there seems to be a, an argument about the discrepancy be, between the area plan and the nature of the area. I mean, the, what is legislative and what is actual. <clears throat> then the issue of the fact that because uh, the uh, open space is unusable according to one side, given the topography, that that may not meet the, the legislation. So I wanted to have some clarity on that, if there's any language about uh, usability on the open space regarding the cluster. Um, I think, and then there was some comment about variance. Uh, Let me st okay, I'll start first. Okay. Um, you asked about policy. And I, I went through it a bit more detail in the, in the presentation, but just as a reminder of the relationship between policy and the subdivision regulations. Um, this table is directly from the subdivision regulations. Um, transects, which is another, which is an aspect of our policies. So as you know that we're on a transect um, standard here in Davidson County, T1 to T6 are the transects, transect one, natural, two, rural, three, suburban. So the subdivision regulations outlined for you the way that they are applied to properties within those different transects. Now within the transects, you have various um, policy areas. For instance, in T3 suburban, you have suburban neighborhood maintenance, suburban neighborhood evolving, suburban neighborhood center, et cetera. And so there are policies that fit within those transects. So the subdivision regulations outline for you how the subdivision regulations are applied to areas within those different policies, okay? This area is a T3 suburban neighborhood evolving policy. So it falls within that T3 transect, the suburban transect. And in that transect for the subdivision regulations, the conventional suburban subdivision regulations are applied to that property. 
uh, which is chapter three of the subdivision regulations, the traditional suburban subdivision regulations. Um, and so that's really the limit of policy in this regard for subdivision regulations as they pertain to this property. So that's that um, question about how it relates to each other. Um, the second question that you asked was in regards to um, open space and the usability of that open space. And the cluster lot provisions thank you, specify that 15% of the property must be set aside for open space. This, the applicant is setting aside 22% or 22 acres of the property, 34% as open space. There are, there is a category of the open space called recreational facilities. So for this subdivision to meet the cluster lot provisions, they must have two recreational facilities within usable open space. It states that usable open space cannot be um, areas with 15% slope or greater. There's a couple of other areas that can't be considered. Now, they have exceeded the number of recreational facilities that are required. There is a playground area designated here within areas that are not within 15% slope. There is a walking, there is a gazebo, sitting area, dog park in this central lies green open space here and a horseshoe facility, uh, horseshoe, I don't know what you call that, court, um, located in this central green area here. And so they're meeting the criteria regards to the number of recreational facilities. Now, they do have a facility located within this area that's steeper slopes. They're meeting the standard, so this is an additional recreational facility located within that area. Was there a third question? I'm sorry if I lost track. I just wanted to clarify. So the 15% don't ha doesn't have to be usable. It's just those two recreation areas. Right, and the cluster lot is the cluster lot provisions are specifically set aside as I kind of talked about before. Um, with the hillside development standards. The cluster lot provision is specifically um, encouraged for properties that have slopes of over 20% so that that slope area can be set aside in open space and not disturbed, which is what this applicant is doing. Okay, I think the third question was this uh, comment about variance. There um, are no variance is required, they're meeting the subdivision regulations. I think our I'll legal counsel might be able to handle that better. I'll answer that. Um, the, as was stated earlier, the subdivision regulations were adopted by this commission pursuant to state law. Um, and the role of this commission when a subdivision request comes before you is to evaluate the criteria, evaluate that is set forth specifically in the subdivision regulations. And if you determine that the application or the concept plan meets the subdivision regulations as well as the zoning code, you don't have the authority to disapprove it. You can disapprove it if you state with specificity that it does not meet the zoning, regu uh, zoning code or the um, subdivision regulations. With respect to the variance, there is a provision in the subdivision regulations that talks about a variance. It says, um, the Planning Commission can grant a variance if an extraordinary hardship or practical difficulty exists or would result from strict compliance with the regulations. And in determining whether or not that extraordinary hardship exists, there are several factors that you would consider, uh, two of which are if the variance request is based on, um, if the variance request is unique to the specific property, um, and that it is not applicable generally to other property, as well as that it's um, based on particular physical surrounding shape or topographical conditions of this particular property. So you look at, again, is there an extreme difficulty and um, if it's unique to this property versus all the surrounding property. And that's, again, that's for uh, um, a variance request if, you know, if there's an extraordinary hardship. Commissioner Bishel? Yeah, um, I, uh, one question. It, in the conditions, um, 
it was uh, specified that the um, developer would need to designate any lots with a natural slope of 20% or greater as a critical lot and denote with an asterisk. And I maybe I just can't see it on the plan, but I, how many of these lots are on a 20% slope or are none of them on? I can clarify that one. We asked them to remove all of the lots outside of slopes of greater than 20%. So no. We, right, but we will get more detailed information in subsequent phases, particularly when we look at a grading plan. We'll have a more a deeper evaluation, and at that point, that's when we would look at at those critical lots. However, if you look at the overall, Lisa, can you show that image of all the topography in the area generally? Generally speaking, I think we, I thought we had about, okay. So generally speaking, if you look at the upper northwest portion of the site, that's where most of the slopes are. There are no lots in there. That was the first set that we looked at. As you look at the rest of the property though, once we get grading information, that's when we can have a little more detailed knowledge. Um, but we would not permit any um, lots in the area in the Northwest where you have contiguous open space areas. Um, another question I had was, um, I, I don't know if this is a fair question, but um, the council lady felt that there could be a compromise. Um, I think if I understand the regulations, the only way uh, right now that we would not make a determination on this tonight is if the applicant um, volunteers to defer. And so I just wanted to um, ask the council lady if possible, what kind of a compromise she thinks could be possible um, because that might give the developer an opportunity to volunteer to defer. So maybe before we go too far because we don't at this point have a motion to defer. Um, I didn't want to move to defer. Okay. I just want to ask her if um, she can give us an idea of a compromise just to put that in the conversation and then we can talk about that okay. briefly. Okay. Okay. I really do appreciate that question. Uh, in terms of a compromise, I've talked to several of uh, the neighbors and we were thinking about uh, downsizing. Right now it's 193 and I know they're uh, approved for even more than that, but that's excessive. And, um, and it was almost as if when I talked to them and I said, well, can we just talk about a compromise? And they said, yes, we can talk about that. And I'm not sure exactly how that looks, but the thing that was mind boggling, it was almost like the engineers and the developers um, were not necessarily uh, wanting to discuss a compromise, but I can't speak for them and I'm not sure, but I do know that a compromise is something that we would be willing to entertain. Thank you. So I'm, from what you just said, I'm guessing that a compromise would mean fewer um, lots, bigger lots and fewer lots, or um, at least the lots on Brick Church Lane would be bigger so that there would be some transition. Is that the kind of thing that you all were seeking? You are correct. Yes. Um, could you just show one more slide and then I'll be done. There's a um, aerial view that shows that there is a dense development just to the west of this, I think. Um, yeah, I guess just to the, what street is that? Um, Night Road. Night Drive. Night Drive located. Right. Um, how long ago was that built? There, the subdivision to the south um, right there was built out in the 80s and this was built out in the, the early 2000s. 
And the density of that is similar to what is being proposed? I don't have the density of that. Okay, those are my questions. The questions are fine. We just can't have the audience participation. <laughs> um, if you would like, but please, if you have additional questions, is there? No, that was it. <laughs> no, that was it. All right, Commissioner Sims. No, I, I'm very curious. Uh, this is really tough in terms of trying to understand, and some of us are still new. And um, what the difference between what the subdivision requirements and going back just to the and this is probably for you particularly, is in the, trying to read the law and what really is our responsibility, it says that um, as a commission, we can, this, the, the law enables the community to require that necessary infrastructure be available prior to development occurring through a comprehensive or land use plan that will identify these. Is that what the next step would do? Well, uh, yes, when they submit uh, the uh, site plan, yeah. at that time, then all the departments would review it. Okay. It includes public works, it'd be water services, us, okay. uh, and we would look at it to make sure that there's adequate infrastructure, okay. whether that's stormwater, water, sewer, and, and the roads. And then those requirements are put onto the subdivision, okay. uh, and then they can either go ahead and build the infrastructure. That's the, the portion you're reading about. Is, yeah. is speaking to that. Okay. It, it, we can either require them to build out that infrastructure, or they can allow them to bond it, okay. uh, so okay. that we can ensure that it will be built. And the other question is, if we were to say yes, does, is there any other option for the neighborhood to negotiate or to compromise? Is this is this the only Audience. Okay, this is the only step that we would have, so. The Planning Commission, when it, with respect to subdivisions, the Planning Commission is the final decision maker. Okay. That's all my questions, thank you. Commissioner Tibbs? Um, well, you know, first it does, you know, just, let me ask a question. The harmonious development that was brought up, harmonious, is that, um, is that part of the policy, the harmonious development? Again, as it relates to the development of land, as it relates to subdivisions, policy has a pretty limited role. The subdivision regulations outline for you how the, subdivision re how the regulations are applied to different policies. In this instance, T3 Neighborhood Evolving, the conventional suburban regulations are applied to this property. That's really the limit of policy application in regards to subdivision regulations. Um, Can I ask one, one point? But mm -hmm. to clarify, in, it's the infill where we have harmonious. We have the authority to evaluate whether or not it's harmonious. Is that correct? Within neighborhood maintenance policies, there is a requirement for lot compatibility be, to be right. consistent. There is also some standards within rural subdivisions, those apply to T2 neighborhood right. policies, and the compatibility applies to neighborhood maintenance policies, not neighborhood evolving policies. Okay, so that's just, I think, an important clarification, because we do talk a lot about whether or not we these are harmonious. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of, because, you know, just uh, when you look at it in this area, it does seem like it's uh, um, something that doesn't fit within what's plan for it, um, but it's, uh, you know, just, so I was trying to really see if there's any part of the policy that um, we could, you know, point to, because the problem is, I mean, I don't know, problem is not the right word probably, but the policy says, it meets the policy. I, um, I, I'm not sure why it wasn't included in the original, it does, but I, I well, I guess it's close to, um, you know, how it's situated is probably why it wasn't a national next. I mean, we heard that it was overlooked, which it could have been, but it, but it seems like it, you know, based on what it is, it seems like, it, you know, based on the policy, I, it's, it's hard to just totally, like I said, and especially listening and people there, um, it doesn't seem like it fits, and that's why I was kind of going back to the harmonious development, but honest, you know, from a policy standpoint, I can't really 
argue it. Um, and I was, I was mounting it mm -hmm. until I looked at all the traffic and parking recommendations because uh, they seem like a lot of the bullets are trying to, uh, you know, address the uh, community's concerns. Because the because I was about to ask, is there plans for Brick Church to get? Um, uh, how how are they going to um, Im improve Brick Church for it? Because uh, you know this is something. But then when I looked, they they were asking for a turn. You know, I guess it's a turn lane that uh, I was going to ask that to the developer shall construct a separate northbound left turn lane on Brick Church Pike. Is that I guess just from the extent in front of the development? Um, I'm assuming. No, that would be where uh, where uh, Brick Church Lane meets Brick Church Pike. As it was pointed out, I think, during the public discussion, um, there's not a direct access on to 24 mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Uh, what, the, what they'll uh, do is the residents will go up to Brick, if you're going to 24, you'll go to Brick Church Pike, uh, you'll turn west, and then when you reach uh, uh, our Brick Church Lane, and when you, when you reach Brick Church Pike, you'll turn right, and that's where the turn lane would, would be put in. Okay, because it, it just said, shall I construct a separate northbound left? turn lane on Brick Church Pike. Okay. Um, and then the appropriate mitigation for Wheeler property traffic impact. So anyway, just like the, the it, it feels too big much for it. And I was trying to go back to it, what's happening on Brick Church Pike, but it, it does seem like there's a lot of conditions that are already spelled out there that they have to meet. Um, and just based on the you know, the policy in the T3 Suburban, whether it's supposed to be that or not, it's hard to find things to, you know, to point to. Um, from a feeling, it seems like a less density would be better, but it's hard to, you know, it's, it is less than what the policy allows. So, um, you know, it's like, well, maybe there should be the trees, you know, it is a lot, it's a very wooded area, but then, you know, they've made more open to, you know, so it's, um, I'm having a hard time coming up with things that would, uh, could, uh, um, that were against policy, I guess I could say. I can't find any right now. Um, so right now I, I'm having a hard time um, disapproving it because I can't come up with enough things to weigh anything that's against the policy. So I'll be open, listen to my other commissioners to see, but right now I'm having difficulty uh, coming up with anything, so it seems like it's it meets policy. Thank you, Commissioner Blackshear. Um, well, one good thing about going this way is that all my questions have been asked. Um, I, I really just wanted a clarification of our role as the Planning Commission as it relates to this item, and also I was really interested about clarifying the ability to use this harmonious development concept, which you. Um, Clarified, And another question I had was basically just the process. Um, this is a concept plan, but then how does it move beyond that? And I think that was also um, adequately discussed for me. I honestly don't have anything else to say. Commissioner Moore? Um, pretty much likewise for me. My biggest question was about the variance procedures. And after hearing the role of, or our role as the planning commission, again, I feel I'm having a hard time finding things um, to not... Uh, or to go against the staff recommendation on this, but that's kind of where okay. I stand. Um, do we have someone from Public Works here? We do. Can we, uh, you know, I, um, as I read through, I mean, it, it seems like there's a lot of improvements on Brick Church Pike, but I drove out Brick Church Lane today, and that's a very different road than Brick Church Pike. <laughs> and so I'm wondering if the improvements um, or the conditions that are in here for Brick Church Lane, they don't feel sufficient to me based on that. It is a very narrow, windy road. Um, um, the width from the traffic study said it's about 25, uh, 20 feet wide. It doesn't have shoulders. It doesn't, doesn't look like. However, once you get into construction plans, and if, it's, if sidewalks are required, we would never put a curb and gutter up next to a 20 foot. So they'll have to submit um, roadway construction plans and it, it will try to, it will have to meet one of our um, uh, roadway cross sections. We have some standards 
and so it will be looked at. Now, the, we've also asked for a little bit extra right away in case more subdivisions are tacked on to the stub streets. At that time, um, maybe a left turn lane on um, at the access points would be warranted. They're not with these, um, with the 193 lots. They even did, they based the traffic study on 240. So even the traffic study kind of over evaluated how much traffic was going to be there because it's really only 193 lots. Okay, but there's not even space to add a left turn lane at this point. That, I mean, they would well, have to. They would have to um, uh, dedicate additional right of way and do that. Okay. And okay. we've asked for that even on their um, exit, uh, their access road off of Brick Church. We've asked for additional right of way in case we ever need a left and a right turn lane exiting. Okay. Um, it looks like they can get sight distance. Um, once the engineering is done, they'll they'll have to um, modify the road as necessary or the access points a little bit to get the sight distance. And that the sight distance would include because they're right, they're coming up a hill. they they they'll have to do a sight distance exhibit in plan and profile, so that'll get your your vertical curve and your horizontal curves. Okay. And does Brick, does Brick Church Lane fall into any, where does it fall on our plan, our various plans? I mean, it's, it's, not a, it's not a road that's targeted for improvement at some point. I, I don't know about, you know about the priority index, about when it would be upgraded? Well, no, and what it is in terms of, is it on in the major it street? It, it's designated a, a collector on the major and collector street plan. Okay, okay. Okay. I mean, I do, um, I was somewhat surprised when I drove out there today to realize that is a, that is a rough, uh, I mean, it's, it's a, it's, I see why the neighbors are really worried about that road. Um, and while I agree with you that, that from a policy perspective, and I think this might just be a question in general, I mean, we have, it, it definitely is consistent within the project but it's inconsistent with the neighborhood. And when do we reconcile that? <laughs> I mean, I guess that's what we did with the suburb, with the rural subdivision regs. Right. So um, let me go back to the policy now. The policies that were adopted in this area, and specifically in this area, actually had another year that the rest of the adoption of Nashville Next didn't have. There right. were those 11 areas set aside in, in Watts Creek that had additional conversation. This area, this property, and the properties, and it's a, it's a bit difficult to see, but this here, and then this here, so kind of making up this swath here, was all established as neighborhood evolving with the, addition, with the initial adoption of Nashville Next in 2015. Some of the area to the north, Sorry, went the wrong way. You can see here's the star. Mm -hmm. So all of that area that I just discussed that's kind of in that swath is that part that was neighborhood evolving with some conservation going through the middle. This is the district industrial. So these areas that were outlined were the areas that had further study that then were ultimately the part to the north here was designated as rural maintenance. So essentially, the policy was set with Nashville Next at that time, and the, the policy, the application of policy is intentional. The location of the policy is intentional and was done so during Nashville Next. This area is adjacent to the interstate, adjacent to area that has an industrial development. Right. And so this is, serves as a transition north to that rural policy area. In the rural policy area here, there are additional subdivision regulations, the rural subdivision regulations, that would govern the development of that property. Right, okay. I mean, I, I, um, I don't think that it was overlooked. I think it's, it, this was a very intentional. I mean, I remember going through this whole process. I do not remember discussing this parcel specifically. Um, 
you know, I don't want to say it's unfortunate that we didn't see this more closely at the time, um, but it kind of is what it is at this point, and it's pretty hard to not find a reason, you know, to say that this that's inconsistent with our subdivision requirements. Any other questions? Yeah, me. Yeah, <laughs> please. Do we have a survey of the tree canopy? A site plan? I mean, there was some conversation on significant trees like a cedar canopy that require preservation. We don't have a tree can survey. If one's necessary, it'd be looked at with the final. Well, I think it's important because uh, some of these lots uh, may require cutting some of those uh, significant trees. And I wonder if there is a opportunity to put a restriction on the request for preservation of trees that are significant. Like maybe over a certain canopy or that meet a certain species. Is that possible, Mr. Sloan? I'm not aware of how you would put that kind of restriction on, on this subdivision application, no. Uh, I do think that it would be looked at uh, when they file the, the site plan, and uh, if we go in there and we find out that there's something that's required to be preserved, then, then we could do that. But uh, without some sort of regulation already in place that gives us that authority, we can't do it through this subdivision application. Because this is not the BZA, right? <laughs> No, that's not the BZA. <laughs> Okay, well that worries me because um, we we are losing the tree canopy and uh, it's very hard to grow a tree from scratch. It they take years. And uh, so I understand that um, all the conversation about how this is a subdivision, we have to, um, I mean the owner has some vested uh, entitlements in the property so I'm not I don't disagree with that. I'm just concerned about the the issue of the tree canopy. That's all. Well, I think it's safe to say we're all very sensitive to a wide range of concerns. It's, um, you know, it's just what's before us is not really open to reflecting all of those concerns. It's a much more straightforward administrative um, process. So, we need a motion. I'm looking both directions I'll do at it. everybody. I'll, I'll do it. I move that we accept uh, the um, staff's uh, approval of this subdivision. Um, is, am I saying it correctly? Recommendation for approval. I'm sorry? Uh, staff's recommendation for approval. Yep, staff's recommendations for approval. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Okay. Motion and second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Do we need a show of hands? I guess we all are. Okay. So we've got. Okay. Can I abstain? Is that permitted? Yeah. <laughs> hmm? I think that. You can talk to legal counsel. Uh, I think courts have said that you can't abstain in, in a situation like this, that you're on this body to mm -hmm. make tough decisions. And, and the legal recommendation is that it needs to be voted for yes. Well, I will uh, reiterate. Yeah. I'll reiterate what, what Director Sloan said, that you um, should not abstain. I think, he, are you asking what planning's recommendation is? Oh, what my recommendation is. No, I mean, I'm just having a hard time uh, not knowing what the tree canopy is to support this. Okay. So that, that's why I'm having a hard time. Well, I, again, I think your role as a commissioner is to look at the subdivision regulations and what the subdivision regulations require. Um, and if you find that it meets the subdivision regulations, I think you need to, um, I don't think you have the authority to disapprove it. If you find that it does not meet the subdivision regulations, then you need to state with specificity um, that it does not, how it does not meet the subdivision regulations. Otherwise, I think um, it would likely be deemed arbitrary. But as uh, one commissioner, uh, uh, who well, I, I could, I would say this: is, is had you been presented with proof uh, that there was a uh, 
uh, some sort of preservation requirement of the tree canopy that existed there, and that was put into the record, and you could rely on that, uh, then you you might be able to, you, you could do that. Uh, but you haven't been presented. Well, only a comment of one of the people that testify about the cedar um, canopy or something. But yeah, it wasn't an official tree forestry uh, expert mm -hmm. making that comment. So, I, I'm stuck. I guess I have to vote yes. Well, I'm, I'm very uh, sad. I'm sure we, most of us are. But uh, this reminds me a struggle I had with the uh, air board in the state of Tennessee when I wanted them uh, to support something and they were reluctant because of politics. I don't want to do that. I just want to do what we are requi required by statute and. If this is what we require, then I'm going to do it. Okay. So the item is closed. And I would certainly appreciate everyone coming down here tonight and know that this is not a difficult decision for us or certainly for the community. Okay. Yeah. Moving on to item eight. Can we take a minute? Sure, we'll take a five minute break. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see, we are on to item number eight. Um, I need my agenda. What's the item between? We also have item 17 coming still, right? And they're here, okay. Okay, so we will move on to item number eight. The next item on this evening's agenda is item eight. This is a request to change from Sir, you can come up <laughs> after he does his presentation. This is a request to, um, to change zoning from IWD to RM20A. Staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions. The property is located at 828 Cherokee Avenue, approximately 1,300 feet east of Jones Avenue, and the property contains 0 0.55 acres. The site is currently zoned IWD, Industrial Warehousing and Distribution, which is intended for a wide range of warehousing, wholesaling, and bulk distribution uses. The policy for the site is T4 Urban Mixed-Use Neighborhood, which is intended to preserve, enhance, and create urban mixed-use neighborhoods with a development pattern that contains a variety of housing along with mixed-use, commercial, institutional, and even light industrial development. These areas are served by high levels of connectivity, complete street networks, sidewalks, bikeways, and existing or planned mass transit. This map illustrates the surrounding network of arterial and collector streets along with the grid pattern of surrounding local streets. Ellington Parkway and Gallatin Pike are located to the east of the, east of the site. Dickerson Pike and Interstate 65 are located to the west of the site. The closest on-ramp to Ellington Parkway is located within three quarters of a mile to the northeast. And as you are familiar, this is the image which shows the growth and preservation map, which is a, was adopted by the Planning Commission as part of the Nashville Next process. The growth and preservation map identifies areas which are most appropriate for growth. This map indicates the location of the site relative to the transition areas as well as Tier 1 and Tier 2 centers. The policy intends to create moderate to high density residential, commercial, office, and light industrial uses. Rezoning this parcel to RM28 will provide an opportunity for this site to achieve these goals. The current industrial uses exhibit a, exhibit a greater intensity than is identified as appropriate for the policy. The policy cites light industrial, non-nuisance type craft, and other cottage industrial uses as appropriate, as an appropriate intensity within the policy. The RM20A Zoning District contains design standards for vehicular parking, building form and location, 
as well as locational requirements for the primary entrance. These standards as required by the Alternative Zoning District of RM20A will foster a more pedestrian friendly environment by implementing appropriate form for structures. Jones Avenue has existing MTA service and an MTA stop is located at the intersection of Jones Avenue and Cherokee Avenue. The nearest on-ramp to Ellington Parkway, again, is three quarters of a mile to the northeast. In conclusion, staff's recommendation is to approve the conditions as the request is consistent with the T4 mixed-use neighborhood policy. Thank you. We'll go ahead and open up the public hearing and the applicant may now come forward. You will have 10 minutes and please uh, state your name and address. My name is, <coughs> first of all, good evening. Appreciate you being here and listening. My name is Roland <coughs> Cannon. I live at 828 Cherokee Avenue. And uh, the reason for the application for rezoning, <coughs> there's a lot of building going on on the street that I live on. A lot of the property owners are considering selling for development. The property next to me has already been sold for developing and I was just figured it'd be a good time for me to get out. That's all okay. I have. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody here wanting to speak in support of the of this project? First of all I want to say thanks to all of you for your service um, to our community. My name is Barbara Rains, and I live across the street from Mr. Rowland. Um, and I do support this because, as he stated, there's just a lot of changes going on in the area. And uh, we just feel that because of that and because there is a need for housing in this area, that, um, that we do support that. Okay. So thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else speaking in support? Anybody speaking in opposition? Good evening. Good evening once again. Uh, my name is Gordon Stacy Harmon. I reside at 1826 Joyce Circle. Um, thank you again for letting me speak tonight. Uh, you folks have a very difficult mandate to balance the desires to increase housing stock while considering the feelings and desires of citizens who already live in these areas. I'm not against development. We need more housing stock, but taking such an extreme swing of density stands to erode the existing neighborhood in favor of meeting a policy that many of my neighbors do not understand, nor do they really approve. To recap just what we were discussing um, earlier with item number three, there are six projects that I'm aware of, three on the, the agenda for tonight. Uh, as well as three others that have met some form of approval and are moving forward that are going to add a total of 549 residences. That's if this particular um, request for rezoning, they put, say, 10 residences on this particular half acre. 549 residences in less than a third of a mile. Cherokee dead ends. It does not go out any further than just a few houses down, which item number 21 on your agenda is another lot about this size that's going to be uh, request to be rezoned RM20, okay? Cherokee empties onto Jones. Jones is going to have not only traffic from Cherokee, both commercial trucks as well as residential, but it will also have traffic from um, the East Trinity SP, which is right up the street, it's gonna have traffic from the Cherokee uh, Master Plan, which is on the other side of Ellington, that has to come across, turn up Jones, and then go to Trinity to get out. That's a lot of extra traffic, as we've mentioned beforehand in other discussions um, tonight, the infrastructure really cannot support that. While this is a small project, it's just one small piece of everything that's going on in our neighborhood, and density of this type just is not good for our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening again. Good evening again. My name is Ashanti Davis. I live at 321 Edwin Street, um, which is about half a mile from this proposed pop property. Um, like, you guys have had a hard night, really. And you guys have to balance a lot, and I understand that you have to balance competing interests. 
And a lot of the arguments that I've made in front of you, I have gave you, I've gathered them from your wisdom when I listen to you all talk. Like my aggregate argument came directly from Commissioner Tibbs. Like I'm not smart enough to think about that on my own. And you know, the last time I was here before you for an upzoning on Cherokee that didn't have a specific plan to increase to 20 units, Vice Chair Fair, Far, I don't care, I'm sorry if I mispronounced it, you mentioned to my councilman like this type of upzoning without a plan leads to gentrification. And that's also a real concern. And so I understand where I live. I understand that development's gonna happen. That neighborhood's already changed a bunch since I've been living there and I expect it to continue. And I'm okay with that. It's just that Cherokee is a dead end. It doesn't, it only can come out in, it can only go in and out one way. And so then you're putting more pressure on these roads like Lishy, like Jones, like Trinity, like Douglas. And these roads have already, they're sort of already at capacity and most of them don't even have a sidewalk network. I don't have a sidewalk on Edwin. There's not a sidewalk on Edith. There's not a sidewalk on Marshall. There's not a sidewalk on Cherokee. There's not a sidewalk anywhere within this vicinity. And so I understand that the developer, whenever it gets developed, has to build a piece of a sidewalk, but these roads are super narrow and you guys have had a long night, so I'm not even gonna waste the rest of your time. I'm just gonna ask that instead of RM20, maybe we can do a higher density, but maybe something a little less. Thank y'all. Thank you. Anybody else speaking in opposition? Uh, with the applicant, you have two minutes for rebuttal if you would like to come up and use those. If not. You okay? Okay, thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and Declare the public hearing closed and um, Commissioner Tibbs. Um, my son uses my words against me too, actually. Um, <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, I definitely feel like that, especially being consistent with the plan, that changing it from um, IWD is appropriate. Um, uh, the RM20 may be too dense for this area, but um, I could definitely see it changing to more, you know, definitely residential and more density. And this would get up to 11 units, um, which would obviously be too much for that area. Um, or is it 20? Yeah. So 11, yeah, 11. Um, but so I don't know, I guess I, I'd be, I would, I, I can't, I would definitely entertain if it, if it would be less density, maybe there was a, a way we could go with less, but I, I, I definitely support changing it from IWD. Um, so I, I'll leave it at that for now. Commissioner Sims. I actually like this plan, so it's my only comment. Um, I just, sure. sorry, Commissioner I just Michelle. had a question. Um, so if, like he just said, um, we thought that RM20 was too dense and there was a better zone that had uh, fewer dwellings that could be on there. How would we handle that? Would we just disapprove this and then they would have to reapply or do we, how does that work? Well, uh, that's the prerogative of the council member uh, to determine what the right zoning is not the commission, the commission can give a recommendation. And then the uh, council can, and if you recommend disapproval, then the council has to have a supermajority to, to pass the, uh, the zoning uh, over that disapproval. Um, and the, the council members uh, may decide that a disapproval from the commission is enough for them not to vote for it, and it won't get it, uh, the, the, the requisite votes of 27 and then the council member may come back with something else. Um, but that, that, those are really your options. Uh, so this lot over on the right-hand side, it's already been um, zoned RM20A? This lot to Can we the see the zoning, do you have a zoning map? All right, thank you. The one that's listed RM20A uh, in black, yeah. that's already yeah. been zoned that? And, okay, one last thing. So if we made a recommendation, I, I, I'm, I'm not making a motion, I'm just trying to understand our role exactly. If we made a rec recommendation for a different zone, not RM20A, we, we would have to decide that now. That seems really difficult. We would just say disapprove. Yeah, you, you're just okay, disapproving, but, but I think Thanks. now that, now that it's, it's come up, you can see, uh, I don't know why the screens keep blacking out and coming back on, but. Uh, you can see here uh, the bottom right towards uh, Ellington Parkway where RM20 is, RM20A, 
and then top left you can see several other mm -hmm. uh, lots there that have already been rezoned to RM20A mm -hmm. and then MUNA uh, towards the end um, and and then you see the lot that is being shown today and then the rest of it is IWD correct Any other questions? We good? Um, Councilman Bender? No comment. No comment. All right, Commissioner Blackshear? Um, I'm probably leaning more in favor of approval of this plan. I did have a question. Um, I mean, so there's been discussion about different zones that would be appropriate um, that are different from IWD. Was there a conversation with the applicant about choosing RM28 or how did that how did that zone as a choice come about, you know? That was, just, that was the zoning that was just presented. originally applied for. Okay. But yeah, yes. No further comments? Commissioner Moore? Um, I, I definitely agree with the zone change to residential, but I am interested to, I guess, see about exploring a, a smaller Sorry, I'm struggling for words. Um, a smaller amount of units on the property, I guess. So, um, yeah, I don't know what the, being new, I don't know what the yeah. next is, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Okay. Can, well, I was just bothering Director Sloan about this, but I was looking ahead to item 21 and, also, and noticing that we're looking across the street and that one and also doing RM20A. I think we've seen this street before with an entire, possibly the entire street going to RM20A, and I think we maybe didn't approve that. No, no we um, haven't. We haven't seen the no. street before? Okay. No, a million others, but not this one. Okay. No. Um, but I'm just wondering if it's better to look at something consistent for this whole street versus two lots. Um, and I, and I, I know it may be out of order to ask a question about a well, future case, but it does raise some questions. When the, when the first rezoning along this street came in on the eastern, the south uh, eastern part of Cherokee, it was staff's recommendation that that was uh, premature and that the whole street should be rezoned. And the intent of the policy being mixed use was that to, to remove an industrial zoning from a residential area. Right now it's zoned IWD and the, the policy's intent is to ch transition that over so that you have um, uses that are not as impacted to a residential neighborhood around there. And so when the first one came in, we thought that that was, um, that it shouldn't be done sort of one piece at a time and we recommended, I think, disapproval and that the whole street or large portions of the street should be rezoned all at once. And the commission disagreed with that and said that um, we can't force people to rezone their properties and that it was... Um, I think what Bob's trying to say is that we had that brilliant idea before and you disagreed with us. The, the, the commission at the time didn't want to force people to, into a rezoning of their property if they weren't ready because there are still some industrial uses being used and that would make that would make them non-conforming and they, they may still intend to use those properties for industrial. So what we've been doing over the last several years since that then is looking at them one, one at a time. I hope I wasn't, but I bet I was part of the ones making that decision, because now it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I'd rather see something that was consistent. Um, it looks very strange to me. I mean, I see why it makes sense on that, on that one that's already got a lot of multifamily on it, but to have these two on opposite sides of the street. Well, I think that was put there after it was rezoned. Okay. And I'll, you know, jump in just to that conversation. That was my thing. Once we approve it, RM20, then there would be, they could be that whole area could just start doing it. And I know it's a case by case thing. It's, we'd have to look at it case by case, but you know, what would, so that's, that was kind of why I wish we, um, we could dial it back. I understand there's how we'd have to do it since the council person's here. We, we can't do it, but, uh, so anyway, that's my that was my problem too. It's like we're getting we we couldn't stop it once it got going. Well, also once we get, I mean, it's one thing to have one or two lots zoned for RM twenty A, but if if that and I mean, I don't think that would be what we would suggest rezoning that entire street for. So I do also worry about opening the door up to. I'd rather see something. I agree on the switch to residential, but I'd rather see something that 
once we open that door up, if individual property owners want to switch, that we end up with something consistent that we want to see on that street. Because, I mean, in those two lots alone, it wouldn't happen, but you've got 20 units that could go in. Um, and talk about changing the nature. If all of those units transition to RM20A, we'd have a, a whole giant multifamily complex out there, which may or may not be the, in, the desire of the neighborhood. So I think you're going to find it difficult uh, as you continue to address these and let's just assume for a moment uh, that you continue to approve them, you set that pattern up to then back away from it uh, when other uh, applicants come that are similarly situated, you're going to have a very difficult time not approving those as well. But I, I also want to point out that one of the reasons you may not see the, the councilman coming in trying to uh, uh, rezone the area in a more uh, um, thoughtful way where it's all uh, one type of zoning district to, to allow maybe some of these lots to be consolidated in a better uh, design uh, for the development to go in place, but is because some of these people probably don't want to let go of IWD. Uh, they may be using these structures and these properties in a way that if you allow, if you changed it to RM uh, 20A or something else, that they would lose the way that they're using their properties. Uh, I would, having driven down this road, that would not surprise me in the least. So he may have pushback from the community about trying to rezone it uh, comprehensively. Wouldn't have to disband their business or whatever. It's just like if they changed over, right? Well, that's true. If you have a legally non-conforming use and you rezone it, you could continue that use, uh, but you can't expand it beyond that property. Yeah. Uh, and so, I, I know that uh, we recently had a case where one of the council members, in a moment of zeal, uh, rezoned some properties uh, against someone's wishes and actually upzone their property, but they didn't want it upzoned, and now that council member's trying to undo that. Uh, and uh, relatively close to this property, not to point at any district in particular, but really close to this property. So, but I guess that's a question for staff is, I mean, we could accomplish the desired outcome of getting residential density there, but does it have to be RM20A? Can it be something slightly less Intense. That's going to be up to the councilman to submit. I know, but you guys can give and, him guidance. And I don't think the RM20A, Patrick can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the RM20A is at the maximum end of what that what that policy would allow. That's great. It's not the maximum. Okay. Chair. Yes. I, I, I don't think that that site would allow you to do 11 units. I mean, that's it just. Won't. No, there's no way you can get 11 you units. You can't. Yeah, so I think the commissioners need to know that it, although it says 11, with but all the setbacks. But once you start consolidating, once you start consolidating and you have that, then yes. you're starting to get, which might be fine, but I think that's a pretty big change in the neighborhood. Maybe with this conversation, we can just talk to the council person as he's maybe thoughtful on how these change, how these come about as they continue from now on as opposed to just, you know, maybe maybe we can think of a thoughtful approach, but I think at this point we probably, since they're not here and we probably, and we don't, at least I don't disagree with uh, the change of residential, so I, okay. I'm going to change and say I, you know, I agree with staff recommendations, approve with conditions. All right. Well, would you like to make a proper motion? Oh, that was it. That was <laughs> <laughs> Do we? Do we have a second? Okay, all in favor? Aye. I'm actually opposed. <laughs> After my questions. Um, okay, so we can't just skip ahead and do So item just 21? for the record, the chair uh, uh, opposed. Yeah. Okay, item 17? 18, 17?
The next item on this evening's agenda is item 17, Heron Point phase two. This is a request to permit 128 multifamily residential units um, and the request is to revise the preliminary plan for a plan unit development overlay district on property located at Bell Road. The parcel contains 14.93 acres. This request seeks to modify the layout of the multifamily structures within phase two to permit 128 multifamily units. The unit count for this phase has not increased beyond what was previously approved. Staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions. The current zoning of the site is RM9, MUL, and plan unit development overlay. RM9 is intended for single family, duplex, and multifamily dwellings at a density of nine units per acre. Mixed use limited MUL is intended for moderate intensity mixture of residential, retail, restaurant, and office uses. And plan unit development is an alternative zoning process that allows for the development of land in a well-planned and coordinated manner, providing opportunities for more efficient utilization of land. The PUD was approved for 452 multifamily dwelling units in 2011. Metro Council approved the planning development, originally named Carillon uh, PUD, in 2005 to permit 165,200 square feet of retail and office space along with 170 multifamily dwelling units. In 2011, the PUD was amended to permit 452 multifamily dwelling units. The PUD was renamed to Heron Point when the amendment was approved. To date, all 324 units approved for phase one have been constructed or permitted for construction. This is the site plan for phase two. This revision proposes one less multifamily structure in phase two than shown in the previously approved preliminary plan, which originally had six structures. Um, a total of five structures are proposed, which contain all of the 128 multifamily units. Access is provided by a connection to an internal private street, which is shown, shown on the left-hand portion of your screen. Emergency, an emergency access point is being provided. There will be a gate that secures the emergency access point. Um, parking is provided in the form of surface, a surface lot with a total of 270 spaces, which exceeds the requirement of the Metro code by two parking spaces. All of the, all of the proposed structures will front onto internal private drives. The site plan indicates a five foot wide sidewalk will be provided along the internal drives to create an internal pedestrian path, pathway throughout the site. Um, a connection to the existing sidewalks in phase one is being made along the entrance drive towards the front of the site and in between building 15 and 17. The site plan indicates a 20 foot wide B landscape buffer will be provided along the eastern property line and a 20 foot wide C level landscape buffer will be pro provided along the northern property line. In conclusion, staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions. Thank you very much. Go ahead and open up the public hearing of the applicant. You'll have 10 minutes and uh, start with your name and address. Thank you. My name is Adam Sager with Dale and Associates, 516 Heather Place. Um, this project, as uh, staff mentioned, was previously approved. We are talking about only phase two uh, of an overall PUD, and this phase has only 128 units in it. Uh, the reason we're back here before you is not so much really to change the PUD or to change the intent of it in any way, shape, or form. Um, what happens in these PUDs is on the front end when they're approved, we have so much data uh, to design and lay out and do things. And then since that time, a survey has been performed. We have learned that the exact location of these wetlands in the bottom, so we know exactly where those are. And so this is uh, more to just shift the buildings around and put them in an area uh, that is going to be more conducive to preserve the wetlands, to, um, to make sure we stay off of our neighbors to the north more so, and we have reduced the building. By doing that, what we have done to keep the same amount of units, again, it's the exact same amount of units that was approved previously, uh, we've reduced the building and then we've used the slopes that are already there to do a kind of a step down in the building. So you have on one hand side, it's gonna look like a three story building and then towards the internal portion of the development, it'll look like a four story building. And the roof line uh, shouldn't change at all from where the neighbors see because we're moving it further down the slope. 
Um, so that's really one of the main changes, uh, or the two main changes, is to adjust the layout to accommodate the new survey and to um, reduce a building and adjust those heights and make sure that that's all um, reflected in the PUD. One thing that I did learn tonight in talking with some of the neighbors uh, who will probably be coming up, in the upper right corner, and this may be a question for staff, I'm not sure, there was a dumpster we put on there and that was a direct um, kind of reaction from public works comments about dumpsters and I've learned tonight that the existing phase one already has a compactor that serves the development. Um, I just didn't want to paint my client in a corner. Maybe that's not a big deal, but if that dumpster is shown on this plane, is that going to be the exact location where it has to go later, or can that be shifted around during a final site plan? I know sometimes those things are, are unknown later on. So that's something that came up tonight, that we would prefer not to have that dumpster in the corner because the neighbors don't want it back there and we already have sufficient uh, trash pickup on the other part. So that's the one item I just would like to get clarification on. Other than that, really appreciate uh, your time and consideration, and I'll reserve two minutes uh, to help answer any other questions from neighbors. Thank you. Thank you very much. So do we have anyone here speaking in support of this project? And anyone speaking in opposition? Please come forward. You will have two minutes, and if you can state your name and address, please. My name is Cynthia Teak. I live at 2172 Branch Oak Trail. Uh, that is in the Woodland Point subdivision. Um, I'm here representing the uh, Woodland Point subdivision from the board level. We have a couple of concerns based on uh, things that happened during the original um, construction of phase one in Heron Point. Um, we have some issues that are unique to Piercy Priest in that um, we have a number of uh, sinkholes around the area that act like um, uh, amplifiers when blasting takes place. We had a very difficult time, ended up resulting in uh, at one point, 15 first responders tied up for 45 minutes trying to determine whether or not a blast that went off that pushed um, a cloud down into Woodland Point was a fire or not. So to avoid that happening uh, in the rest of that particular project, we requested that uh, the, the blasting be, levels be reduced, the amount of charges that they were using. Um, that took care of the program and we've talked to the builder about that. He's quite amenable to doing whatever needs to be done to keep that from happening again. Um, other issues that we have is um, the high density that is coming into the Bell Road area needs to be addressed for the very simple reason um, that um, that corridor is one lane both ways, uh, most of the corridor and it ties up traffic. We've got a 50 mile an hour speed limit along that uh, section of road and we'd like to uh, approach them to get it reduced to 40 miles an hour from Catchville Pike down to Woodland Point Drive. Um, we've, our accident rate has increased, uh, tripled in the last two years. I pulled the statistics from um, uh, Metro PD and, it, and that's, those are only the reported accident. It doesn't count all the fender benders. Um, we're also asking for a 30-foot buffer zone between Woodland Point and um, Heron Point because there's a huge drop-off right, uh, right at the property line uh, that varies anywhere from 30 feet to uh, maybe 10 feet, depending on where you're at on the property line. The problem that we have is that uh, the Vilas section of Woodland Point we're going to give you the, a full five minutes because you are representing the uh, association. Thank you. The, the, uh, the villas sit overlooking the whole uh, here in Point area. So we had a conversation with the builder and they're going to try to work with us to increase that buffer zone um, because we were under the impression it was going to be 30 feet, which is what we had agreed to in the, when the original uh, PUD was set up. Um, something happened between the meeting that we had at the council and when the final was filed and we didn't catch it and it was filed with a 20-foot buffer zone. 
So we're trying to not have our residents looking, uh, you know, right out at rooftops if possible. Um, the other thing is we are in complete favor of removing that dumpster from the plan. First of all, they do have a trash compactor and they can actually arrange to have additional pickups if they need to. But more importantly, the noise levels uh, that occur around those dumpsters um, are not conducive to sleep. And the villas sit very, very close to that. Um, the sinkholes cause more um, amplification of noise out in that area. So um, we'd like to see that thing go away. Um, the other thing is we'd ask that the outside parking lot at the northeast corner be moved back um, as far as possible uh, to give more of a buffer zone between the parking lot and uh, Doe Ridge. Um, one thing that the Planning Commission needs to take into mind when they're doing any kind of approval on projects along the Bell Road corridor between Smith Springs Road and Elm Hill Pike is we only have three corridors in that area to evacuate people during uh, a fire emergency or a gas line emergency or whatever. Um, we're getting really tight on space in there. We're getting more high density. So that's uh, something that I'm requesting that you take into consideration on future development. Thank you for your time. Um, you have a difficult job. Thank you very much. Anybody else speaking in opposition? If not, then the applicant, if you'd like to use your two minutes. Sure, I won't take up much more time. Um, just to address a couple quick comments. Uh, we, we could build what's approved right now. My client has chosen to pull some of those buildings away, so hopefully we're helping to accommodate. We're gonna continue to work with the neighbors to help work with that. I think it's only good to work with your neighbors. And um, the parking lot in the northeast corner that she mentioned, certainly when we get to final site plan, we can look at pulling those off the property lines as much as possible. Uh, the one thing that was mentioned was the landscape buffer. We are amenable to um, providing whatever the original PUD provided. If that was the 30-foot C buffer, landscape buffer, uh, that's fine by us. Um, and I think uh, the other thing she mentioned was density. My client says they did already widen the road, Bell Road, in front of phase one, so we did road improvements already to Bell Road. Um, I think that addresses most of the comments. Oh, sinkholes was the other one. Uh, of course, with any development, sinkholes pop up, we have to address them, we're gonna avoid them at all possible. And uh, I think during the survey there was uh, some, a closed contour that popped up in the far corner and we're, we're staying off of that as of now. So if anything pops up, we will have to deal with that during final site plan. So um, I think that's it, appreciate it, thank you. Thank you. I will declare the public hearing closed and um, let's see, Councilman Bednick, can we start with you? No comment, okay. Commissioner Bichelle. I'm in favor of this. I, I would vote to approve. Okay. Commissioner Sims. Um, I actually think this is a nice subdivision that you've done in the first phase, and this is complementary to the second phase, so I, I approve. Commissioner yeah. Tibbs. Yeah, I would support staff recommendation. Commissioner Blackshear. I would also support staff recommendation. I wonder if the accommodations that the applicant um, was providing to the neighbors, whether that would be something we would put in the conditions. Yeah. Okay, so we would just need to make sure that we got all of those conditions. That to, to answer the question about the dumpster, I think we would be able to approve a relocated dumpster at final, um, as long as public works is okay with that, and we would, staff would not want it to be in a more impactive location closer to the adjacent neighbors, or, but we, we would look at that and make sure that whatever new location it ends up in um, is farther away from any ex existing residents and public works is okay with it. And I think if you had the condition that they meet the original landscape plan, I think that is something you can add today, then they will have to meet that. That would be the 30 foot at buffer? The, at the, the 30 foot buffer and at the final. Okay. And they wanted the parking lot moved a little bit over. Yeah, I think 
Is that something that? Yeah, can I think you, if you can add those as conditions for the final, then that's what we will review when the final comes in. Okay, great. Commissioner Moore. I'm also in support, so um, would you like me to go ahead and make the motion? Welcome <laughs> to make a motion, and, so, and we want to add the conditions. So I move to um, support the staff rec the staff's recommendation with the addition of the um, the 30 foot buffer and the parking lot and the dumpster. Did I cover everything? So, dumpster, dumpster relocation. relocation. Possible, possible dumpster relocation. Possible relocation of the dumpster and possible relocation of the parking area. Okay, I'll try to get the requirement <laughs> for the buffer. I think would be mm -hmm. okay. So possible relocation of the parking lot and possible relocation of the dumpster and inclusion of the 30-foot landscape buffer. Yes. Perfect. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. All right, motion carries. And we are on our final item, item 21. Right. The last item on this evening's agenda is item 21, uh, which is a request to rezone approximately 0.48 acres on Cherokee Avenue from IWD to RM20A. Um, staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. This site is located um, on the other side of the street from the case you just heard on Cherokee Avenue, um, closer to Ellington Parkway. The parcel is vacant. Um, as a reminder, IWD zoning um, is intended for a wide range of wholesaling uh, and bulk distribution uses, and RM20A is intended for single-family duplex and multifamily dwellings at a density of 20 units per acre, uh, and is designed to create walkable neighborhoods through appropriate uh, building placement and bulk standards. The proposed zone change is consistent with the T4 mixed use policy, um, which is intended to enhance urban neighborhoods by providing a diversity of housing and mixed use areas. Cherokee Avenue, as you've heard previously, um, contains a mixture of uses and um, could support um, additional residential units um, based on the surrounding development pattern. The site is located in an area of T4 mixed use policy that is adjacent to evolving um, suburban, uh, I'm sorry, urban neighborhood evolving policy to the north and south. Um, so multi-family development at this site will um, provide additional housing opportunities um, in proximity to those non-residential um, land uses. Nashville Next, you've seen this, um, identifies the site as a transition or infill area where higher density housing is appropriate along and around corridors um, and centers to provide harmonious connections to those neighborhoods. Um, the site, again, is located south of East Trinity Lane, um, which is identified by the growth and preservation map as a high capacity corridor um, that transitions to a tier two center um, near Ellington Parkway. And really briefly, zooming out, you can see the site, um, its proximity to the centers, and then the surrounding um, corridors and, and downtown, which is about four miles away. The um, current IWD zoning is not supported by or consistent with the T4 mixed use policy, as it could permit future development that is not compatible with the area. The requested rezoning from IWD to RM20A creates potential for redevelopment that is consistent with policy. Um, this policy was purposely applied to this area with the adoption of Nashville Next to encourage development that is compatible with the surrounding area. 
Rezoning to a non-industrial zoning district um, is, encourages less intense land uses in an area which is envisioned to become primarily mixed use, um, which is consistent with policy and is consistent with the surrounding context. The RM28 zoning districts um, supports moderate intensity residential development that could that contributes to the mixed use um, pattern along the block, and it includes standards for development, including the location of building and its associated parking, um, glazing, and foundation requirements as well. Um, so rezoning to an alternative zoning district, again, will ensure that future development is consistent with the mixed use neighborhood policy and with the context, and for these reasons, staff recommends approval with conditions. Thank you very much. We'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Is the applicant here? Good evening, thanks for waiting it out with us. Yeah, no, thank you guys, appreciate it. Uh, my name is Nathan Agnew. Um, we are a uh, residential uh, building company and it is our intention to do town townhouse size or townhouse homes on this property. Uh, we do believe that it fits uh, very similar developments that are already in the area and uh, we do also believe it fits within the policy and have support from the councilman at this point, so. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we didn't get your address. I'm sorry. Oh, it's uh, 854 Cherokee. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. Do we have anyone here speaking in favor? Anybody speaking in in opposition? Come forward. Good evening, once again. My name to. Um, to refresh your memories, Gordon <laughs> Stacy Harmon, I live at 1826 Joy Circle. Um, in respect of your time in the late hour, I'm gonna make this as brief as I possibly can. Density, density, density. Um, you've already approved a property earlier just down the street that, that to be rezoned as RM20. I'm not opposed to this being a residential area, I just would prefer it to be more in line with the, uh, the general zoning in the neighborhood of RM5 or RM6 to minimize the number of lots and the amount of traffic that this particular uh, lot would, would then add into our neighborhood. So that's all I have to say for this one. Thanks again for your time. Thank you. Good evening again. Good evening again. My name is Ashanti Davis. I live at 321 Edwin Street. Again, you guys have already heard my comments. I'm not gonna restate them. I just reiterate what I said the last time just due to the late hour and how long y'all how long y'all have been here. So thanks for listening. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, we have a Madam little correction we need to make okay. in regards to uh, the previous Cherokee case uh, when we were showing you how much had already gone to RM20. Um, between the time that case was originally, originally filed and the slides were created and the time that this case was filed, uh, the these other properties had gone to RM20A as well. And so this is, depicts the direction that this area is moving in. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, we did not give the applicant their two minutes for rebuttal. Would you like to come, do you have anything further? Okay, we will declare the public hearing closed and I will start with you, Commissioner Blackshear. Well, feel like we already went through this uh, before, so I will save everybody time and just say I am in favor of uh, approval of staff's recommendation for the reasons previously stated on item number eight. Thank you. Commissioner Moore? Um, likewise, I'm also in support. Commissioner Tibbs? I'm in support, but I really would uh, ask staff to speak with the council person more, more about this street, I encourage him to, but I'm um, in support of this. I have the opportunity to speak with this council member most days. <laughs> Commissioner said For a month. <laughs> no comment. Commissioner Bichelle? Um, the, I'm in support also, but it does seem like there should be a more comprehensive plan for this block. So I don't know how we recommend that officially, but it sounds like we're all recommending it, so there you have it. Thank you. Councilman Bedney, no comment. Do I have a motion? Make a motion to approve staff recommendation. Any other uh, second? Any other discussion? 
All in favor? Aye. Okay. That wraps it up. So we're on other business. Historic zoning, do you have we, any update for us? We're just excited that um, the mayor has, uh, for the metro, the uh, grant for, um, mm -hmm. what's it called, the rehabilitation of historic commercial buildings. And so we wanted to announce that. We're really excited about it. So anyone who's interested, please get on the website, National Office of Economic Community and Development, and solicit your proposal. Thank you very much. Uh, our parks person is out. Um, we do not have an executive committee report. A legislative update. Anything from you, council, Councilman? Everything is good. Everything is good? <laughs> Director Sloan, do you have anything else for us? No. You want to talk about RM20 some more? No, I don't want to talk about <laughs> RM20 uh, or... Uh, yeah. No. I have nothing right. else. Well, then we are adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.